G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And before the episode begins, I would like to give Native another shout out for sponsoring this video. Native is a great company that provides safe, simple, effective products that people use in the bathroom daily. Their products are formulated without aluminium, parabens, and talc, and instead are filled with ingredients found in nature. Native have been super generous and allowed me to try some of their products, and I've been using them for some time now. And the product has been just reliably fantastic since day one. I recently ordered a bunch of deodorants, and the service for the delivery was great. I've been using the citrus and herbal musk deodorant, and the smell is always super fragrant. A little bit more subtle than the eucalyptus and mint, but still fantastic. And what I noticed about this one too is that, just like the eucalyptus, it lasted both on body and also in product really nicely. I'm a pretty busy guy and I work out a bit, and the deodorant that I received and the stuff that I've ordered through them has honestly not let me down yet, and has always kept me smelling super fresh. And although Native is priced at a slight premium compared to conventional deodorants, it's really safe and really effective. The other thing I loved about Native was their commitment to eliminating things like aluminium, which may be linked to serious health ramifications, including breast cancer and Alzheimer's, from their products. The selection is really big and along with some great reviews from customers, there's something for everyone on their website. Some of the scents that they have are coconut and vanilla, lavender and rose, and my favourite, the eucalyptus one. Must be the Aussie in me, hey? <laughs> they also have free shipping and returns and even offer a completely unscented formula and baking soda-free formula for people with sensitivities. So, for 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code SCARED during checkouts. That's 20% off your first purchase at N-A-T-I-V-E d-e-o-d-o-r-a-n-t dot com and use the promo code s-c-a-r-e-d at the checkout. I hope you guys take up Native on their generous offer and without further ado, let's begin. So, I work at a hotel in my town, and I was driving my husband's truck into work, as he was taking mine to the shop to get serviced. He has a, a very large truck, and I only drive it when I absolutely have to. But when I pull into the side parking lot, I notice the entire lot is covered in snow, and no one can see the lines for the spots. So, I begin looking like a moron and try to park in what I hope is a spot, backing up and moving forward several times. When I finally park, I get out of the truck and I grab my backpack when I hear someone yelling from the sidewalk from behind the parking lot, hey, you need to learn how to fucking park. I'm embarrassed, I'll admit, but I just close the truck, lock it, and begin walking to the front of the building. Now, the hotel has a side entrance for employees, but it takes a code and I have a shitty memory, so I just walk to the front and I go through the main entrance. I hear the guy yelling again, did you hear me? I walk faster and take a peek behind me, and this guy is following me. I keep walking, but call back, please just leave me alone, I need to go to work. And before I can reach the corner of the building and make my way to the entrance, the guy grabs my arm and spins me around. Now, I will never forget what this guy looked like for as long as I live. He wore dark clothes with a torn up winter coat, his eyes were bloodshot as hell and he smelled like a combination of cigarettes and whiskey. I guessed he must have been drunk, but he didn't slur at all when speaking. He said to me, you're coming with me. The guy began dragging me back to the truck and I tried to pull my arm away from him and I told him to let go of me. He said, give me the keys, we're taking a drive. I began to yell for help and his grip on my arm got tighter. I'm a 26 year old woman, not skinny at all, but a lot smaller than this guy, that's for sure. He was dragging me easily and the snow on the ground just made my feet slide along the ground quickly. I yelled out, someone help, please, but no one was near us and I kept fighting to get away from this guy. I prayed that there would be guests that could possibly hear me, but it was our slow season so most likely there was no one in the rooms on that side of the building. The guy turns back to glare at me and tells me to shut the hell up and give me the keys. Now, I was carrying my backpack on one shoulder as it was big and bulky from my uniform and shoes. 
I quickly slipped the strap down my arm, grabbed it, and I swung it right into his face. The guy let go of me, and I just ran for my life to the front doors. I heard the guy screaming, but I ignored him. I was way too scared to look back at him, and eventually I ran inside and all the way to the employee locker rooms. When I finally calmed down enough, I went to the front desk to talk to the security. Sadly, there were no cameras on that side of the building, so nothing was recorded. They called the cops and I made a report. The cops informed the general manager of the hotel that they needed to seriously consider security cameras on that side of the building, as drunks and druggies were known to be in that area. There was a bar just a couple of streets down apparently, and it was common. They got the description of the guy and said that they'd keep an eye out for him. The manager apologized like crazy about the incident, but I told him that it wasn't his fault. He's a really good guy, and I did ask the security guard to follow me out so I could check on the truck and whatnot. Thankfully, it was fine. The security guard promised to make more rounds outside, especially that early in the morning. I told my husband what happened, and he drove me to work the next day, and was happy to see that the security guard was keeping their word that they would make rounds outside that time in the morning. They still currently are, which is great. I'm driving myself to work again, but... I don't get out of my truck until I see that security guard, and he watches to make sure that I get inside okay. I think he's also hoping to catch the guy if he comes back. The guy that covers him on his days off as well does the same thing. I'm also getting pepper spray and maybe a knife after work today. Sadly, I haven't heard from the police yet, and maybe I won't. Hopefully the guy was scared off from coming back to the area, or maybe he tried to go back and the security guard scared him off, but either way, I really hope that I never see this guy again, or if I do, at least he might be in handcuffs. So I work at San Diego CA International Airport. I fuel aircraft and do a lot of doubles and overtime, so most of the time I'm working. Here's why this is relevant too. I work night shift and I live about 120 miles away, so when I'm not working, I'm usually on the road. I commute a lot, so by now I'm pretty familiar with my route. There's this particular spot though where if I need to take a leak, I can exit the freeway and be out of sight for the rest of the traffic. This spot is about an hour into my drive up in the mountains. There's nothing around for miles, but my highway patrol or border patrol station somewhere in the mountain, since the border is south, just a few miles in. And so, I exited my vehicle, turned off the engine, and I killed the lights, and went on my business, and when I was done, I thought that I heard footsteps nearby, but it was so dark and foggy that I could just barely make out a figure. With the occasional passing by of a vehicle on the freeway, it's very quiet, so I hop in my car and start the engine, and I switch the lights on purposely steering in the direction of the figure to light it up. And when I get there... It looks like a young girl dressed in black. Loose, long black hair pushing a stroller in very short and slow steps. And she's coming from a, a rugged and small dirt road that I'm pretty sure only border patrol trucks use. Since it leads to the mountain. But from where I am, I could see the long little road all the way into the mountains where it makes a turn behind a boulder. I'm about 10 feet away and so I lower the window with the intention to ask if she's okay. I mean... It's 1am, super cold. I'm advancing slowly at this point, and I'm pretty close, but I'm trying to see inside the stroller, and I see two small hands moving, just like when a baby is playing with its hands in the air. But here is where the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up, because I hear grunting, pig-like grunting, coming from the stroller. And now that I look at her, there's no freaking face. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, and I remember I exclaimed out loud, Nope, steered the other way, and just drove towards the freeway. All this happened in the span of about 20 or 30 seconds, and all I know is that I'm never going to stop there again. So I, a female, was 15 at the time grade 10 in sophomore in high school. I grew up in a small farming town. Population at the time was 1,400 in Washington State, USA. 
I met Ricky, a male in shop class, where we flirted daily. I was the only girl in the class and assumed that that was why I was flirting with me. I also assumed that he was 16 since he was in my grade but had his license when he was actually 19. In school, I was popular in that I was friends with just about everyone, but Ricky was very handsome and very popular for actually being cool. So, I was super excited that he paid attention to me and even started flirting with me, even though, like I said, I figured it was because I was the only girl in class. I'll admit that I let him on in a big way. I figured nothing would ever happen between he and I since he was really good looking and popular and had beautiful girls just throwing themselves at him in the hallways and other classes. So the flirting had become more and more sexual with us talking about actually having sex, even though I actually had no intention and thought it was never going to happen anyway. The shop class had a regular classroom in the high school where we took attendance and tests and then the shop itself was located about a uh, hundred yards away from the main building, I'd say. The high school parking lot was on the opposite side of the high school building from the shop class. Our school had open campus as well, meaning that students could leave campus during lunch if they had the signed form filled in with the office. So, in late spring of that year, 1997, Ricky and I were flirting one day when he suggested we actually go through with it. He suggested that we leave right after that class, during lunch, and head to his house. I don't know why I agreed other than realizing that I had talked and talked about it for weeks and couldn't admit that I'd been lying the whole time. So after class, he and I left the shop and we walked around the back of the school to the parking lot. We got in his nice truck and we drove away from the school. I was freaking out internally because, one, my friends were expecting me to leave campus with them and were waiting by my locker, and two, was I really about to have sex for the first time with one of the hottest guys in school? We drove through town and went to his house about a half a mile from campus. We went inside and as soon as the door closed, he started kissing me. To this day, this first kiss is one of the best I've ever had. I couldn't completely appreciate it at the time because, well, I was still freaking out. We made our way to his bed and continued kissing for 45 minutes while he kept trying to get me to go further with him. He had stripped down to his boxes, but I still had everything on, including shoes and jackets. He wasn't pushy or anything, but just trying to go with what we had discussed for weeks. After 45 minutes, I said that I just wanted to go back to school. He sighed, put his clothes back on, and then we left. We drove to the school in silence, and when we got to the parking lot, he asked if I was okay. I said yes, and got out, and I walked quickly inside. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw his truck leaving the parking lot. Lunch was still going on, so I went to my locker, grabbed my books for my next class, and I went in the classroom to read until class started. Shortly before class started, two of my friends that I was supposed to meet for lunch came in and they asked if I was okay and where I had gone. I said that I was fine and didn't want to talk about it. One of the girls then left to go to her class, but the other girl, Allie, was in the class with me, so she stayed. About halfway through the class, I just decided to tell Allie about what had happened and made her promise not to tell anyone. She was concerned, obviously, and made sure that I realized that I'd put myself in a dangerous situation, and no one knew where I was or even with whom. To be honest, I hadn't even thought about that until she pointed it out. The next few days, Ricky went to school but skipped shop class. I was fine with this too because I didn't really want to see him, mostly because I was just embarrassed. But Ricky started coming to class again and tried talking to me, but I was quite rude. For about a week, in fact, shop class consisted of him trying to talk to me, me ignoring him, him sighing, and then just walking away. After that, I was much more civil, but never went back to flirting with him. He started approaching me between classes and even during lunch, just being friendly and lightly flirting, but I never returned to flirting again. But random groups of girls started approaching me and asking what was going on between Ricky and I, why did he like me, and why was he ignoring them? etc. And I just didn't really have any answers. The second to last week of school, Ricky hung around me often but was really quiet. And then he told me that I was the first girl to ever turn him down. 
During the last week of school, he went back to hanging out with his friends and flirting with the pretty girls and I was quite relieved, mostly because I felt guilty for leading him on like that and also guilty for putting myself in that situation. About midway through the summer holiday, I actually ran into Ali and she asked if I had heard about Ricky and I told her that no, I hadn't and she said that Ricky was on the run from the police for the attempted murders of two men. She said that she heard that it was a drug deal gone bad. I was shocked and I let my imagination go wild with thoughts of what if. I mean, I assumed that if he was willing to murder two men, what would have stopped him from raping or even murdering me? A year later, one of the men died from complications from his wounds, so the charges were actually changed to one charge of attempted murder and one charge of murder in the first degree. I later found out that it wasn't actually a drug deal gone bad, but was actually a failed cartel hit. I have more info on that and why I don't believe Ricky would have actually harmed me or pretty much anyone, if it hadn't have been for his dad's employer, but this story is pretty long, so I'll finish it here. I don't really know what happened to Ricky and I heard that he fled to California and then possibly to Mexico, but one thing I do know is that he was never caught by the police. I firmly believe that there are many unexplainable things in this world. You know, the things we have hard times discussing with others about because you don't want to be labeled as crazy, but you know that they're there all the same. And my dad's house, I believe, contains such an entity. There really isn't one big story to tell, but rather a bunch of small ones that combine into something really hard to write off as just sheer coincidence. Most of these are told from my dad's perspective, although I was able to experience one for myself. So I was spending the night at dad's house one time, and we were all in the living room just watching TV. My little sister was on the couch with my dad and my stepmom, and I was sitting in the recliner with one of my dogs. The other dog was laying in front of the couch. In between the couch and the recliner was an end table and sitting on the table was a glass box that my stepmom got from her mum. We were paying it no mind when suddenly we just heard a crash. We weren't expecting it so we all jumped and the glass box on the table had fallen off the back side of the table and had broken. Now, the glass box had been sitting a good distance away from the edge, so it couldn't have fallen off on its own. No one was close enough to bump the table, and it was honestly like someone just lightly pushed the box off the edge. Like, kind of what a cat would do or something. Well, we investigated for several minutes before chalking it up to just another one of those incidences. My dad was standing in the middle of the living room watching the TV. It was in the middle of the day at this point, and he was the only one home. When suddenly, from the direction of his and my stepmom's bedroom, he heard a loud and deep ha-ha, and his first thought was that someone had actually broken into his house. So he ran in there, ready to beat the daylights out of the intruder, only to find an empty room. He looked around for a while, and he never found anyone in there, and it was a weird one. Another time, my dad was in the living room again, it was just him and the dogs and he got up to grab the remote and he made a comment. You know the kind that you make when you think out loud? Well, then he heard someone hiss, silence in his ear. And my dad, the king of underreactions, simply grabbed the remote and on his way back to the chair said, How about you shut the fuck up? And he didn't hear anything else the rest of the day. One night, my dad and my stepmom had just gotten into bed I mean that they had just pulled the sheets over them, and the door that leads to the bathroom shook. I'm not talking about some sort of mild shaking that may come with an old house. I mean it was like someone took hold of the door itself and was violently trying to shake it off its hinges. Needless to say, my stepmom was glad that my dad wasn't working nights that night. Along with these things, there are some shadow people sightings made by both my dad and my little sister as well. One time, the middle of the day again, my dad was in the kitchen watching one of his football shows. Something compelled him to look toward the entrance of the kitchen and he says that he saw shadowy disembodied feet walk across the entrance. 
My dad, once again, the king of underreactions, looked out the kitchen and when he saw nothing, he just shrugged his shoulders and went back to his football. This sighting is something that both my dad and little sister swore up and down to that they both saw. On the right back corner of the living room, there's a very short hallway with three doors and a door to the bathroom, a door to my room and a door that used to be my sister's room but is now used for storage. The two bedroom doors are on the right side with the bathroom door right in front of them. You can actually see the bedroom rooms from the living room and they said that they saw a shadow figure leave the bathroom and head into the storage room. That being said, the storage room seems to be where this thing dwells when it isn't bothering my family. It's to the point that my sister refuses to ever even go near that room again and even just walking past it is enough to cause your hairs to stand on end. I could go on for hours about all the little things that happened, but I'm going to stop here for now. If any of you guys have any idea of what we're dealing with, I would love to know. This happened years ago, but still haunts me to this day. Back when I was in middle school, I lived next door to a small neighborhood. All I had to do was hop the fence and I'd be in the neighborhood where all my friends lived. We were all between the ages of 12 to 13 and there were five of us. Well, one of the houses we were always at had a backyard in the edge of the woods and we had created trails throughout it, complete with bridges over the creek that led to a reservoir of sorts where all the rainwater went as well as the water that drained from the sewers. I say sewers but it's just runoff from the streets and we use the tunnels under the road during intense games of manhunt. Anyway, we called the place The Wall. The wall backed up quite literally to a house in the neighborhood and the next street over, and we could clearly see houses through the trees in any direction that we looked, so it's not like we were ever really far. Besides the trail that we took as well, there was a main exit along the fence to that house aforementioned that led straight into the heart of the neighborhood. Now, the wall was right by the next street over. On our side, where the wall sat, there were three houses. In one of those houses lived a well-known police officer whose kids we were friends with. The opposite side had one massive farmland to the left and a heavily wooded area to the right, complete with its own empty, boarded-up, creepy house that couldn't be seen from the road unless it was winter. No one had lived there or even been there for years at this point. So, like I said, and I'm trying to paint a picture here so you can understand, we were very, very close to other homes, which makes this story just an odd one. One day, my friend and I, and just the two of us girls, decided to go to the wall. Taking the familiar trails through the woods, we made it to the wall. Weeks prior to this, the group of us had been trying to make a bridge so that we can continue our work. Between picking up branches and heavy stones, we noticed something coming from the woods across the street. It was a, a man, and this man was dressed head to toe in camouflage. Typical hunting gear that I've seen before, but... The weird thing was that he had a shotgun in his hand, in a residential area. Luckily we noticed him before he did us, and I'm so glad that we did because when he noticed us, his eyes locked on both of us and his pace began to quicken and he made a beeline straight at us. He never said a word or even lowered his weapon, it was just in his hands ready at any given moment, but we snap out of it and we take the exit sprinting into the heart of the neighborhood, running straight to my friend's house to tell somebody. But we tell her dad immediately and he goes to check it out, only to find no one there, not even a trace. I don't know where or how that man was out of sight so quickly, but her dad wasted no time and was down there in seconds. The wooded area where the man came from was not large by any means, at least not large enough to ever consider hunting on and... It definitely was not hunting land or anything. It's an extremely residential area, along with an elementary school that we used to walk to in less than five minutes. I mean, no lie, the school was right there. So I just never understood why the man was out there in the first place, especially since there was a cop who lived right next door to where we were. So my grandfather owns a cabin near Lincoln, Montana that I went to many times as a child and teenager. It always just had a very strange and uneasy feeling to it as well. 
There's a, a large boulder about 12 feet tall with a flat top that I would climb. And one day when I was standing on the top of it, I felt someone shove me from behind. I fell to the ground and got the wind knocked out of me. My mother was watching the whole thing and asked why I jumped. Because there was nobody behind me. A few years later, I was staying at the cabin with our friends and the two of us decided to go to bed early. That's all I really remember, but this is what the two that stayed outside by the fire said happened. So apparently, both of us woke up an hour later in the cabin and just started screaming at them to let us out. Apparently, I pounded on the door and screamed at them to unlock it. They started freaking out as well because there isn't a lock on the door and they didn't understand what the hell was going on. And when they finally opened the door, they found us both just sound asleep. Another time when we got there, there was a deer carcass just curled up in the fire pit, but that might not even be paranormal. I mean, other small dead animals seem to be a pretty common thing around there. And that's about it, really. We haven't been up there for years, as I live in a different part of the country now, and I don't know if this is a particularly interesting story, but... I figured that I should share my experiences anyway because they're weird and I don't know. I'm wondering if you guys have any idea as to what's going on there. So, uh, I'm a mail carrier and I know, I know, super interesting, right? Honestly though, you'd be surprised at the amount of weird stuff that happens to us. I've had people follow me while I'm delivering and try to get into my delivery vehicle to steal stuff. I've had a customer vomit on my car after she opened a parcel her husband sent her that was supposed to go to his mistress. I've delivered dildos that fell out of their flimsy packaging. Dragon dildos no less as well. I've seen people having sex near my more secluded boxes and they didn't stop for me. And this is the kind of stuff that typically happens to us contract carriers. For those of you who don't know, contract carriers are mail carriers who buy a contract for a mail route that is typically in a rural area that, from what I understand, the fancy mail jeeps cannot traverse. So we use our own vehicles to deliver the mail and we're paid monthly based on what type of route, how long the route takes on a day-to-day -day basis and what the post office deems as fair. Technically, we're self-employed, but still have to abide by the rules of the post office, and we still have to become certified to even touch the mail. But of course, being in the areas that we're in most of the time, that kind of weird stuff I mentioned above happens all the time. Those things happened to me when I was a sub, as someone who works for a contract holder but does not own the route in any way. I was basically paid by the person who owns the route out of their own pockets. But now, however, I'm the somewhat disgruntled owner of a 10-year route contract for the first time. I've owned the contract for about uh, 7 months now, I think, and it's a pretty easy gig. The route itself takes about 2.5 hours to case, sort the email for delivery, and another good 3-4 to four hours to deliver on a good day, 5-6 to six on a super heavy day. I'm really not looking forward to how the holidays fare on this route as well. But anyway, the thing is, is that... Before I got the contract, I had no idea what I was bidding on. The way someone gets a contract is that they bid for it. The person bidding will give a monthly salary amount that they feel would be a fairish thing for the route in question. The post office and the bid holders then decide which amount is the most accurate, in their oh-so-wise opinion, for the route, and they give it to whoever has that amount. And I was lucky enough to get it. And so, I get a pretty damn good pay that I technically chose for myself. All I knew of the route, though, was that it went down into this valley. I live in a very small desert city with some very wide, outlying mini-communities. These outlying areas are where the majority of our office's contract routes deliver to. My route goes 25 miles out of town to a lot of small ranching properties in the closer areas and to some, well, pretty scattered random loaner properties in the farthest area. There are a lot of hills and dirt roads where I go, and it's very easy to get lost out there if you don't know where you're going. There's one area in particular, though, that goes through a small forest nestled between a random outcropping of hills, uh, heading out onto the state highway. It's not like um, an evergreen forest or anything. Uh, that's just the closest definition I can give. 
They're not really trees so much as just kind of gigantic bushes that nestle together very closely on either side of the road. That is towards the end of the route though, but it takes up a good chunk of my customers' addresses. So, when I was training, my previous owner of the route, I'll call him Jim, gave me a rundown of the people who live on the route. There are a lot of ranch owners, of course, and they're the ones who get the most parcels. This isn't really that surprising to me, since they're the richest people out there. And we, of course, call that section the ranches. There are the elderly retirees that live at a tiny retirement community set up by the city just outside there. It's pretty spread out, like a teeny little town sort of, of their own. That's the area where the second most amount of parcels, lots of random buying and sometimes gifts from relatives and whatnot, and we call that area the retirement homes. These are the customers that I talk to the most. They're the outskirters, as Jim called them. And these are the people who live so far off the grid that most of the time, we don't really deliver packages to them. As a general rule, we're not allowed to deliver boxes to a house if it's more than three miles from the mailbox. Most of them live about some five or six miles from the boxes. Their boxes are in long lines, or clusters as we call them, on the side of the road. As a courtesy to these customers though, I ask them to give me their phone number so I can call them if they have a parcel and they meet me at the box. Most of them don't mind and I'm grateful to them because a lot of those roads are pretty treacherous. I once tried to be nice and deliver a box to one of them and I actually got stuck, unable to move my car for almost four hours as I lost service. Eventually they found me and that's when they gave me their number at last and they don't get many boxes though in that part of that route. But then there's what Jim called the ghost town. It's not really a town per se, but more of the secluded homes like the previous area. But these guys are closer to the road and they're the ones who live in the forest that I mentioned above. He called it the ghost town for a good reason as well because these people are either never home, as most of them are snowbirds, or the ones who are, are really creepy. And there's a few homes out there that are usually vacant, more snowbirds, that just have a lot going on. But for the stories I'm about to tell you, there are three homes involved. Two of them are in the ghost town, and the other one takes place in the outskirts area. But that last one is by far the worst, so I'll leave that to the end. There's more, obviously, but these are by far the most interesting as far as history and the stuff that's happened. I'm telling them in order of intensity, so stick with me. I'll give each house a name here as well, since I pretty much do at work anyway. It's kind of how I remember their addresses without really having to think about it. Real names have obviously been changed for customers' privacy, though. So, the Bailey Cluster is a grouping of homes in the ghost town that belongs to a single family with the name of Bailey. The mailboxes are all nestled together on the side of the road against some of those large bushes in the forest that I mentioned. Just before the mailboxes, there are four total, is a small dirt road that leads up to their property. The whole road has to be about four feet across, I'd say. And that's how it feels anyway, because when you're driving up, the bushes on either side will scrape the side of my car. I've gotten more than a few scratches because of them as well. I've asked them to trim them down, but they just never do. So in the end, I just gave up. When you get to the property though, you're met with this large six foot tall rusted iron gate with the name Bailey fashioned out of bent horseshoes and pipes kind of welded to the top of it. As a general rule, if a gate is shut, we are never encouraged to try and open it to drive in as well. We aren't really supposed to walk in if it's shut either, unless the customer has told us that it's okay. For the Baileys, I get out, I walk their parcels through the gate and up to the first house, which isn't far from the gate. Now, I have to state that I've never once met these people in person. I've spoken to them on the phone and I've been on their property, but I have never once seen hide nor hair of any one of them. There are a total of 10 people at the address and their mail is split up as their homes are in like a, a trailer park of sorts. For example, one of them gets their mail at one ghost town road, another one gets it at state 8, and the other will get it at mobile 2 or 3 or 4, but there are four people in one and two, and one person in three, and the others are all in four. Every time I bring them a parcel as well, I always just leave it at the first house. 
Once you walk through their gate as well, you have to walk up a, a bit of a hill. You can see the total green roof of the first house peeking up over the hill as you walk as well, and when you get closer, it becomes apparent very quickly why the place is just so unsettling. Clowns. These people, they love clowns. There are clown statues, paintings, mobiles, wind chimes. I mean, you name it. It's just clown face everywhere. They even have clown dolls scattered around the place and none of them look nice. They're all kind of threadbare and worn out from sitting in the hot desert sun all the time and I'm pretty sure animals have made homes in some of them as well. There are actually a few that are even big enough to house a small family of squirrels. Now, I know that this isn't paranormal or even all that creepy, but you have to admit that it's more than a little lot, right? The first house is a simple single wide mobile with a bright teal green painted roof, and the windows all have clown decals in them. Little clown faces that honestly look like they're straight out of a vintage coloring book, hand colored and everything. At one end of the place is the porch. It's not too big, just about some six or seven feet. But there's a small awning with dozens of clown wind chimes and sun catchers hanging from it, almost making a curtain out of them, they're so clustered together. On the porch is a rocking chair and this thing is painted like a clown. The curved rockers are painted red, the legs that attach them to the chair are yellow with red polka dots, the seat and arms are white and the back is white with three big red dots painted on it like puffballs and a clown shirt. The top part of the back has a clown face on it, and you put it all together, and I'm telling you, it's a nightmare. The reason why I mention this chair as well is because it's where I'm asked to leave the parcels. And I always do, but I'll never forget the first time that I left them there. There were four boxes for them, and one for one, and the rest for three, and I called ahead of time to let them know that I'd be out there in about three hours, and they're towards the end of the route. It takes longer to get to them, in other words. I'm always told as well by who I assume is their matriarch or something to leave them all on that damn chair. I've never been up to their property at this point and I'd been delivering about a month but only ever had mail and small parcels that fit in the box for them. So when I went up there for the first time, seeing their little clown cluster was a bit nerve-wracking for sure. I mean, I'm terrified of clowns, and I have been since I was a kid, but that's a story for another time as to why. But I crept up to that first house, and I peered around the place. It's so isolated and odd that I felt like every single clown around me was just watching me. I placed the boxes on the chair in a neat little pile, and I settled the chair to stop it from rocking so the boxes wouldn't fall off. Once it was still, I turned, and I hastily tried to leave but it was the creaking that stopped me. I froze and I listened, knowing full well what it was. I turned and, sure as shit, that chair was rocking. And not just a little bit, but enough to knock one of the boxes onto the porch. It was honestly like someone had deliberately pulled it all the way back and thrust it forward to rock as violently as possible. You can bet your bottom dollar that I didn't hesitate one bit. I just ran and I noped the hell out of there and I was not staying after that. Another time I had a parcel for them, I almost wrote it up out of protest, but I called and again was asked to leave it on the chair. And this is the time that I noticed that it felt like no one was actually there. What I mean is that I'd been there a dozen times by then and... I remember standing at the top of the hill by the gate just peering around me like, where is everyone? According to their mail, there should be at least a few children that live there and when I was there that day, it was the middle of summer and why weren't the kids home, playing outside or something? And why didn't I ever see anyone there? The second and the third houses are a bit far away from the first house. It'd be about a five minute walk I think to get to them, but you can see them pretty well. And the curtains are always open. But I just never see anyone inside. The fourth house is the farthest away at the top of a small hill and they have a big picture window facing the gate. It too always has the curtains open but again I just never see anyone there. But the weirdest of all definitely is that their vehicles are just always there but 
they never move. There are two trucks, an SUV, all relatively newish as well. The oldest, I think, was a 2012 model and an old station wagon, and the wagon looks pretty run down, but the others look like they've been pretty much taken care of, always clean at least. But anyway, at this other time I had a parcel and I noticed no one is ever around and so I got curious and I phoned the woman I always do when bringing parcels. I'd figured that I'd just tell her that I was making sure someone would be back soon to get the parcel as there's a lot of theft out there. But this isn't a lie as well because there usually is on more secluded routes. You'd actually probably be pretty surprised at just how much more common it is out there than in the city. I heard a phone ringing in the first house beside me. If I'm on the porch, I can peek into the window just behind the evil rocking chair and it was close. The phone that was ringing I mean. And I wanted to see someone pick it up so I squeezed myself between the chair and looked in. I had never looked inside before. More clowns of course and some clown themed throws on the couch and the pillows too. And on a side table clearly visible from the window I could see the cell phone lit up with mail lady on the caller ID. No one ever answered. But, but when I left she called me back and I'd been gone for about a good five minutes I'd say when she did. I just told her that I wanted to be sure that someone was home and she said that someone is always here. According to Jim though, he never saw anyone there either. The third and the final most interesting thing to ever happen at the Bailey Cluster was just last month actually. I got a very large box for them, one I needed a dolly for in fact and I called before I left the post office to let them know and the lady I always speak to told me that she would have her older son help me. I thought to myself, finally I'll get to meet one of them. This ought to be good, right? Well, I get there and it's my last package and then I was free to breeze through the final 50 or so boxes I have after them. I have a total of about 670 boxes on my route by the way and I go to the back, pull out the dolly, slide the box out onto it and start dragging it up to the gate. I look around and there's no one to meet me of course. The lady told me though that he'd be waiting for me on the porch of the first house and when he saw me he'd come down to help. You can see the gate from the porch pretty well but I can never really see my car from it. So I honked just in case he couldn't see me either. But no one came down. I waited for about five minutes before saying screw it I'm just going to take it up. And boy did I struggle up that hill with it. I don't know what was in that box but... I'm pretty sure it weighed at least 75 pounds. The post office has a 70 pound weight limit that a lot of companies try to stretch up to about 75 to 80. Usually they go to UPS but sometimes they slip through the cracks and they come to us. But anyway, I get to the first house and of course there's nobody there. I look around and as usual I'm alone with a bunch of clown dolls just gaping at me. I wiggle the box up on the stairs on the dolly and I lean it against the railing next to the rocking chair. It's way too big to sit on it and so I just head down to my car. And that was when I hear thank you from behind me. It's a man's voice and I assumed it was the son who was supposed to help me. I quickly run back up the hill and not only is there no one there but that box is gone from the porch. This was in the span of about 10 seconds as well and I wasn't even down the hill all the way. It doesn't take that long to walk back down but I looked in the window and everything and I just didn't see a soul. I really do hate going to the Bailey Cluster and I end up going there a lot these days. So the second house, this place is the one that gives me the most creeps. While I was training too, Jim told me about this place. This is another snowbird place where the people only live there between October and March. They were there when I started and they actually came back at the beginning of this month. Super nice people as well and I actually really like them but I don't have a clue as to why they live there. Jim told me that back in the early 90s when he first started working at the post office, the guy who used to do the route before him told him the story. According to him, there was a family of five that lived there and all of them were absolutely crazy. The mum had schizophrenia and would apparently abuse the kids because of the voices. 
The father was no better. He was a worthless drunk who just sat by while his crazy wife hurt the kids. And one night, the eldest child, who was 18 and finally fed up with how they were raised, tried to escape with his siblings. But the mother, of course, tried to stop them, and the kid just finally snapped. And he murdered his parents and painted the walls with their blood. The incident changed him, and while his siblings escaped, he apparently stayed in the house with his parents' corpses until he ended up slitting his own throat and tried painting the floor with his own blood before succumbing to blood loss and dying himself. And they weren't found for months. The place was eventually cleared out and torn down and rebuilt, and the guy who built the new house was compelled to paint the house red. It's not obnoxiously red or anything, but it's just too red if that makes sense. There's no long driveway up to this place. It sits right on the road at the end of the ghost town. The end is literally just a dead-end road, and they're right there at the tail end of it, where signs tell you to just turn around. The current owners, we'll call them Mr. and Mrs. Nice, because they're nice and I'm not all that creative at the moment, have told me countless horror stories about living there, though. And to be honest with you guys, I sometimes think that they get some sort of a, a sick thrill out of it or something. When they're not there though, I just forward everything, but I have to pass their house to get to the turnaround spot and the neighbours always have mail, so I go by them pretty much no matter what. And let me tell you that I've seen some just really weird shit out there. But every time I pass the blood house, I just get this awful feeling of dread. But what I mean by this is that whenever I did delivery packages to them, I'd step out of the car and just standing at the edge of the driveway honestly feels like standing at the precipice of a cliff. I feel like stepping onto their property is like jumping off to my death or something. It's terribly unsettling, and I honestly don't know how they stay there for as long as they do. I mean, they live there for six months out of the year, so I guess for them it might not be too bad, but if I feel that way just delivering packages once in a while, I don't know. It just doesn't make much sense to me. But anyway, Mrs. Nice told me one day to always watch the third window from the left, because apparently that's where the son who went mad likes to sit. She calls him Tommy, even though that wasn't his real name. She feels it suits him though, and she talks about him like he's her own son or something. I think that she pities him, and she believes his soul is trapped there because of all the horrible things that happened to him. When she first told me, my reaction was just, no thanks. But one day, the temptation just got the best of me, and I looked. When you're at the mailbox, you can see into all their windows, and the house is a, a long one-story place with six windows, three on either side of the small front door. Of course, the house is red like I mentioned, but the trim and the door are all white, and the window in question is the one that sits right next to the front door on the left. The Mrs. Nice told me that that's the front guest room, and so I looked. And I could barely believe my eyes, because I didn't see a full-bodied apparition or anything like that, but I definitely saw a face. And it looked just so anguished. Like, you know the happy and the sad mask that you see for drama and theater? It looked like the sad mask. Just pain. But I blinked and the face was suddenly gone and the curtain, which was open, was now closed. Another time, I actually walked up to the house to put a package by the door. The nicers went home that day. The truck was gone, so I decided that I would put the package around the back and leave a note in their box to let them know since I didn't have a number for them at the time. When I walked around the back, I put the package over the small fence into their backyard. And once I did, I turned and... I felt myself just run into someone, but there wasn't anything in front of me, nothing but air that is, but I swear that I felt something was in front of me. I didn't want to move forward, it was like an invisible wall had just been erected before me and while I couldn't see it, I knew that if I went any further that I was probably going to get hurt. It just felt really oppressive and strange and I actually backed up into the house and slid along the wall all the way to the front, and whatever invisible force was there, I felt like it followed me. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but 
I actually began to cry because I felt like there was a person just pressing up against me as I was moving, like they were trying to force me back. Once I hit the edge of the house too, I, I just bolted and I ran to my car and I just sped away. I cried most of the way back as well because it was just so, I don't know what else to say, but terrifying. When I told Mrs. Nice about it the next time I saw her too, she said that Tommy likes to do that. He tries to intimidate people and he does it to Mr. Nice all the time apparently. Around the third week too, after the Nices left for their summer home, I passed the house and I swear that I saw someone standing at the mailbox. But... It just wasn't solid, if that's the right word. It was like a, a blurred outline of a person when I got closer, and as I passed, the head seemed to turn with me as I drove by, just sort of watching me. I don't like passing that house, and I'm glad they're back for the winter, because it makes me feel a bit more at ease to know that they're there. But I still don't like the idea of delivering packages to them at all. I do not want to be anywhere near Tommy. But now for the last one, which, of course, I saved the worst for last. So the third house I call the Hills Have Eyes house, and I hate this house. This is the one that isn't in the ghost town. This is in the section before it, the outskirts. These are the homes that are so scattered that we usually don't bring parcels out for them because they're just so far away. But this house is an exception because it's less than a mile from the cluster of boxes that they get their mail at. And these people are never home from what I can understand. Jim told me to never call them too because they're apparently very rude and very hostile. He instructed me to just go to their gate if they have a parcel, always bring the mail with it or they'll call and complain, leave the parcel in the basket that hangs on their fence with their mail in a rubber band, and then just turn around and leave. He said to never linger there as well, and he told me that if I did, they would definitely get hostile. And so, I just do as I'm told, but thankfully they've almost never been home while I've been there. But I'll tell you right now that there's something there, and I know that sounds so cheesy, but it's true. I don't know the history of the place itself, but just that these people are apparently the world's biggest pricks, Two men live there or something, brothers from one Jim has told me. They run a small chicken farm and bring their eggs to the feed store in town to sell them at the time. It's not uncommon to see their chickens roaming around on the road leading up to the house. The road itself is barely a road if I'm being honest. It's more like a bumpy little walking trail but it's the only way to get there and I know I've said it already but man, I hate going there. I call it the Hills Have Eyes house because it's settled between two large hills and from far away the hills look like eyes and the house honestly looks like a mouth. That and the way this place looks, it looks like something just out of the movie, The Hills Have Eyes. There's uh, butchering equipment everywhere, bloody knives and cleavers and chains and hooks and they've got cows too but I think they keep the meat for themselves. The smell is just atrocious too and it always just smells like death. It wouldn't shock me at all too if these guys committed murder out there and only butchered cows when they did it to make excuses for the stench of death because it's that bad. And every single time I go out there, something always happens. I've been out there six times to deliver parcels, so I'll recount each incident. So the first time I was out there was about three months after I started delivering. I did as I was told and I wrapped the mail in a rubber band and I headed out to the house. It takes a good three or four minutes for me to get there. It's around a bend and then that's when you see the other two hills that the house sits between. The main house has a fence around it with a gate but the whole property has an outer fence with no gate that you can go through. But once you're up against the gate, the whole place just looks smaller than it actually is because it's just full of junk. It's full of the butchering stuff and random metal sculptures and a bunch of worn out furniture, garbage, a few skulls here and there and then the house itself. The house is just a small trailer that's been cemented into the ground so it's no longer mobile. A makeshift ramp or a porch thing sits against the door and leads to a side gate and this is where the basket for the packages is. 
All around this gated area are coops and other fenced areas for the animals as well, and it's smelly and weird and just creepy around there. So I just toss the box and the mail into the basket and I turn to leave. And after seeing this place for the first time, I definitely did not want to stay at all. When I got to my car, I looked in my rearview mirror though, and I swear that I saw a man standing behind my car. But when I perked my head out to ask him to move, there was nobody there. And of course, after that, I didn't stay for one more second. The second incident was much closer to the evening. It was another super heavy day, and I did not want to go out there. But as I was approaching, I saw someone standing at the window of the house. I assumed that it was one of them trying to see who was coming. I have car magnets on my car that all say USPS on them so people know who I am. I figured that he'd seen them and be more at ease knowing a package was coming and not some random weirdo. But as I approached, the figure in the window seemed to kind of distort and just eventually vanish entirely. When I saw this, I did not want to get out of the car. I just wanted to stay there and toss the parcel and the mail at the window. After working up the courage though, I sped from the car to the basket and back and I went to leave. But as I was getting into the car, I heard this really loud laughter and it sounded like it was right next to my car. Like someone was standing beside me and just went, ha ha. And after that, I prayed that I wouldn't have to come back for a while. But two months later, I had to go back with four big boxes for them. But this time it was a pretty light day and I was breezing through delivery pretty quickly so I was happy about that. They were about in the middle of the route so they are like a halfway point to me and I went to the house and was greeted by a large bull in the yard. I'm not usually nervous around animals but a bull isn't someone you want to mess around with, right? He was standing just a few feet away from the fence with the baskets so... I just patiently waited to see if he'd move. I didn't want to honk, lest the angry bastards who lived there just happened to be home and come out to yell at me or something. I didn't want to shoo him because, honestly, I didn't think it would work. When all of a sudden, this bull moves and freaks the hell out, thrashing about like someone was riding him. He came dangerously close to my car as well before running off into the area where the fences are. And then, a whole chorus of moves erupted from that area and... It was just a cacophony of noise. I grabbed the boxes and I got them to the fence as fast as I could. I didn't know what spooked the bull and I didn't care. I just wanted to leave. I didn't see anything this time but I was afraid of the bull coming back and tearing up my car or even goring me in the process. Now, the fourth incident is honestly not the worst but still pretty unsettling. So, I never had a package so small that it actually fit in a box for them. And honestly, I almost said screw it and just shoved it in the mailbox. I should have, but I didn't want them to call and complain. They hadn't complained on me so far, so I wanted to keep it that way. So, I reluctantly headed to the house again with the package and their mail. And when I got there, there was a single dead chicken hanging from the awning above the porch. It was weird, but... Given this place's track record, it honestly wasn't that surprising. And definitely not as surprising as the giant dressed cow hanging from the pole on the other side of the yard. I didn't notice that until I was putting the package in the basket. It was obscured by a tree when driving up the place and as I'm walking back to the car, the chicken and the cow both started to just suddenly swing. Now, it's not windy and even if it was, one of these things is a cow. I didn't think a light breeze was going to push a cow, but they're swinging back and forth almost in tandem, and at this point, I just said nope, and I left because I wasn't about to stay for the rest of that show. The fifth time was two weeks ago, and it had been quiet for a while since I was out there, and I had vainly hoped that I wouldn't have to go back for longer, but I will. The holidays are starting, and everyone's getting their stuff, so it makes sense. So I get out there with three boxes and for the first time I see a living breathing person in the window. Jim told me that one of the brothers was in a wheelchair. This was apparently that brother. He was bald with a weird tribal tattoo across where I believe his hairline used to be. Just sitting in the window just staring at me. I waved out of courtesy and of course he didn't wave back. 
The first time either of us had ever laid eyes on one another, but I don't know what I expected him to do. Maybe smile back and wave or something, but I guess I know damn well that these guys are pretty much dicks. I noticed as I put the parcel in the basket, though, that he wasn't looking at me, but something behind me. And I looked, and I saw someone walk up behind one of the chicken coops. I looked back at the brother in the window, and he gave me a sort of grumpy, uh, you saw that right, kind of look, and nodded toward the coop. I just kind of slowly nodded and went back to the car, and he watched me back out, and as I was turning back onto the road, I saw him leave the window and draw the curtain closed. The last time was actually yesterday, and thus far, it's definitely the freakiest thing next to the book. So, I was having a typical holiday season Monday, very heavy day with lots of mail and lots of parcels and whatnot, and of course, they had to have a whopping five parcels delivered to them. So, I get out there at about 4pm or so, and I'm already exhausted, halfway done, knowing I'm not going to go home until about 7. It takes a good 45 minutes to get back to the post office, and another 10 to unload and finish my day. I know I won't be finishing the route until about 6 or so, so I'm just trying to hurry everything along. Going out to this place too doesn't help in making good time, so I get out there, get out and put some of the boxes in the basket and the others below it and I go to leave. When suddenly, I feel a hard tug on my shirt that pulls me back and I fall on my ass in the dirt. I hit my head on the edge of the trailer and swear to myself before getting up. I thought maybe I just caught my shirt on something, but as I get further away, I feel another tug and fall back again. And this time, I know I didn't catch on anything because I was about two feet away from the fence on my left and there was nothing on my right and nothing directly behind me either. And at this, I scramble up and try to run and pull hard as I feel another tug and I hear that god-awful laugh again. Once I broke free from whatever this thing was that was holding me, didn't look back and I just ran for my vehicle and I left. I still talk to Jim every now and then about this stuff and when I tell him about these incidents he goes, oh yeah, that place is haunted, more so than some of the others I think. But in Jim's opinion, the whole route is pretty much damned. There are, as I said, other places out there where weird stuff happens as well but these are by far the ones that I found the creepiest. After yesterday's little incident at the Hills Have Eyes house, I felt like I wanted to share these stories with someone other than my husband as well. But, either way, I'm obviously in a contract now, so if this is the best of the last seven months, I'm sure that I'll have way more after these ten years are over. Thanks for listening if you got this far. I know it's pretty long, but I had to get some of this stuff off my chest because it's just eating away at me. I've always been afraid of the dark. More than that, in fact, I've always been afraid of the curtains being open at night. The big black void of the backyard from the kitchen window is just unnerving, so I make it a point to close the curtains before nightfall. That said, the first incident happened about a week and a half ago. Now, our neighbours across the street had had a lot of company lately, so the sound of car doors and people talking and stuff like that had been a common thing the past few weeks. They'd only lived there for about two months, and since they moved in, lots of people were coming and going. However, this usually stopped when it started to get dark, at least on most nights anyway. So when I started hearing sounds akin to doors opening and closing outside, I got a little bit nervous. I started thinking that maybe the neighbors just had a random night visit from someone. Some people do, I guess. I mean, I do sometimes. So I kind of put it out of my mind. I just continued watching videos with my husband. After about an hour, he fell asleep and I kind of rested my head on his shoulder, still watching videos. Until our dog, Penny, rose her head up and started growling. This dog is a master alarm and I mean, anytime she hears something outside that doesn't seem right, mostly just at people showing up unexpectedly or people talking outside or stuff like that, she'll perk up and growl or bark. Whenever she does, I go on high alert, especially at night. Our other dog, Clementine, isn't so quick to be aggressive, 
She's still a pup, only seven months old. She had no reaction to this except to sit up and try and play with Penny while she swerved away from her, ears and tail pointing straight up and alert. I immediately lifted myself up from my husband's shoulder though and I got out of bed. I should note that for the past couple of weeks, we slept in the living room as we're having our bedroom and bathroom renovated on. Our mattress is on the floor between the couches and just behind us is a small hall that leads to the laundry room and one of the two back doors in the house. On this back door is a window with a small white curtain and I hate that door. The curtain on it is very see-through and I try my best to avoid it at night but as it's the most readily available window, it was the one that I went to check and see what Penny was barking at. When all I saw was darkness, I checked the front windows and saw nothing. After a while, Penny calmed down and took her place at the foot of the bed next to the couch. Clementine, too, took her place sleeping in the front of the windows behind the couch that's in front of our bed. I put it out of my mind, thinking that maybe she was just having a senior moment. She is 12 years old, and she's had moments where she's just barked at nothing before. When I heard the sound of rustling just outside of the back door behind me. Outside, there's a lot of tools, a workbench, and a couple of old washers that we took out of the shed not long ago to try and get rid of. There's also some lawn chairs that make a very distinct sound when pushed across the concrete patio. And this is the sound that I heard. I know this sound because when the dogs are outside, Clementine runs into them and even drags them around a lot. So much so that I'll sometimes just stack them in the shed to avoid it. Penny immediately starts growling again and even barking a couple of times, stirring my husband. I was frozen and didn't want to get up and check, so I shook my husband and told him what I'd heard. Both of us got up and checked the back door window by us and the large picture window in the kitchen, as well as the window in the back door in there. Eventually, he resorted to grabbing a crowbar from the tool closet inside and peeking at the kitchen back door. There was nothing there. He sighed and told me that it was probably just the wind blowing those chairs around. They weren't exactly heavy, just those cheap white plastic ones some people have and it actually was kind of windy that night too. But I still couldn't just shake the feeling that that wasn't it. Cut to two nights later though, it was a Friday night and my husband had gone out with a work friend. I was alone browsing on my laptop when all of a sudden I heard that rustling again. Only this time, it wasn't just the sound of the lawn chairs in the patio. This time, it sounded like someone was actually in the shed. The laundry room behind connects directly to the shed, which is actually a small carport or garage type room that we just store all of our excess belongings in. So anytime a sound is made there, if you're in the living room, you can actually hear it quite clearly. This time, not only Penny began growling, but even Clementine, who never growls, began to follow suit. And this made me nervous. I called my husband and told him that I heard something in the shed and he immediately told me that he'd head home straight away and to keep the doors locked. I ran to each door, making sure that they were all locked. When I passed the kitchen, I caught a glance at the picture window in the kitchen and I'd forgotten to close the curtains so they were open in the darkness of the backyard. Against the dim glow of the light in the alley behind the fence, I saw something move. I froze because I had no idea what to do. I didn't know how long it would be before my husband got home and I didn't want to go near the window to shut the curtains for fear of whoever was out there seeing me. So I hid behind the corner by the kitchen with Penny and Clementine at my legs as though guarding me, both still growling. I clutched my phone to my chest, trying to remember if the back door by the kitchen was locked or not. I ultimately decided that I could easily crawl through the other opening to the kitchen without being detected as it was out of the way of the window and led straight to the back door. I got on my hands and knees and slowly crept my way to the opening and at least from there I could clearly see the lock and maybe wouldn't have to go all the way to it at all. And this was by far my biggest mistake or possibly my saving grace. The front door window has a clear view of where I was and it just didn't occur to me until I heard the security knob jiggle. I froze and snapped my head to face the front door window. In the light of the porch light, I could clearly see someone peering in at me. If it was my husband, he would have just come in straight away. But instead, whoever it was, just stared. 
I couldn't see their face as the security kind of blurs the image through the window, but either way I could tell that it wasn't my husband. I didn't think, I just dashed down the hall into our bedroom, messy though it was with the wood and the paint cans and the rolled up carpet all over the place, I knew that I could at least hide in the ensuite bathroom and lock the door, while also locking the bedroom door behind me of course. I immediately called the police, who made me stay with them on the line while they sent an officer out. My husband got home first, practically scaring the crap out of me when he knocked on the bedroom door. I came out of the bedroom and unlocked the door and threw my arms around him. And not long after that, the police came. But there was no sign of anyone outside or even in the alleyway. I didn't sleep at all that night and neither did my husband. He just kind of laid there with a crowbar next to him and our dogs were restless too, heads and ears constantly perked up, peering around like they were listening for any indication of an intruder. Cut again to two nights ago though and after the whole thing with the police I had a hard time sleeping so I've pretty much ruined my sleep schedule by staying up until my eyes could literally not handle being open anymore. And that night I was watching a movie, trying to focus on pleasant, happy films to put my mind at ease when without warning, Penny began howling and barking viciously with her head stuck between the curtains of the windows behind the couch that's in front of the bed, and my blood ran cold. I stood up to peek outside, and the neighbors across the street were all standing in the yard, talking quite loud, but something just didn't seem right. They all seemed to be looking in my direction, and Penny was not letting up. She was barking so viciously I almost didn't recognize her. I mean, I've never seen her so worked up. I couldn't get her to stop no matter what I did, so I eventually just pulled her from the window. But she wouldn't have it. She jumped on the chair and shoved her head between the curtains of the window by the front door and just continued. My husband woke up and instantly went into protective man of the house mode. He grabbed the crowbar from the floor beside him, walked over to the window and looked out to see what she was barking at, telling me to stay behind him. And when all that he saw was the neighbors, he got a little bit irritated by this. He'd been as stressed as I was since the whole police incident and was finally getting some decent rest. But still, despite what it may have appeared to be, I told him maybe that we should call the police again. Seeing Penny that way just left me really uneasy. The whole situation just seemed off. At first, he was reluctant, saying that they wouldn't do anything if nothing had ever happened. But as he said this, he just went paper white and his eyes burned into the picture window in the kitchen behind me. I turned around and saw three figures climbing over the fence into the alleyway out of our yard. I immediately called the cops again and my husband tore out the back door while I begged him to stay inside. I mean, I didn't know if those guys had a gun or what while all we had was the crowbar. The police were there in seconds it seemed, fast for them to be honest around here. And luckily, they caught up with all three guys who ratted out my across-the-street neighbors. Apparently, according to the officer that we spoke to, these people had warrants out for their arrest on multiple offenses. One was wanted for possession of drugs with the intent to sell. Two of the other guys had outstanding warrants for assault, while the girl that lived with them was wanted in the next state over for armed robbery. Which meant that it was truly a den of criminals. Apparently they'd been watching us as well as our neighbours to the left and right, figuring out our schedules for when things go quiet or when we're at work, trying to find a good time to break in and just steal any valuables. Yesterday I spoke with the neighbour on the left. She's a very nice lady and she's lived next to my family for the past 14 years. She told me that she thought that she heard someone breaking into a home a couple of weeks prior and immediately installed a security system. I can't help but think that this must have deterred them from her, so they may have moved on to try and rob us. Our other neighbour luckily hasn't had any trouble, which kind of makes me nervous though when I think about it. It's been quiet since though, and the house across the street was pretty much searched, and the rental company emptied it out this morning. It's just eerily dark over there though, which gives me the spooks. While I've always had a weird fear of opening windows at night, I'm kind of grateful that I forgot to close the curtains that first night. If I hadn't have seen that first guy in the backyard, maybe I wouldn't have tried to crawl to the kitchen door and notice the one at my front door. And if we had closed the curtains on the night that they all got caught, 
maybe my husband wouldn't have seen them all in the backyard either. Either way, I'm just glad it's all over and no one was hurt in the end. I feel a lot safer now and just maybe I'll finally be able to get some sleep. This happened when I was 19 or 20. I'm 31 now, rarely drink or go out anymore, but last weekend a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a couple of years asked me out and we ended up going to a club on the street where this story takes place and the whole thing just reminded me of it. So legal drinking age in Brazil is 18. People here start partying pretty early and let's face it, no one really knows their limits when they start drinking, right? My friends and I had gone to this club. I honestly can't remember the name right now, but I know it closed down a couple of years back. And we had a great time, and the sun was coming up as we were leaving. Most clubs here give you a credit card when you walk in, where you either put in the money you plan on spending, or they work as a personal digital tab where bartenders add up what you're drinking and whatnot, and you pay for it on the way out. I pay for my stuff, and I sit outside to wait for my friends who are taking a long time to get out, probably due to just being drunk as hell. As I'm sitting there though, I notice a car across the street. Two dudes in the front seats, one out of the car trying to make this clearly drunk out of her mind girl get inside as well. She's mumbling and stumbling, struggling to keep her eyes open and she's saying no, I don't want to go, over and over, shaking her head, clinging onto the car door as the guy keeps telling her to let go and get inside, that they're just going to a friend's apartment to drink some more, it'll be fun, come on. I watch on, wondering if I should do something, if no one else is seeing this happening. I look at the club security guard, he looks at me and he shrugs, like it's not his responsibility. I look back at the girl and I'm really uncomfortable but also scared. My friends are still nowhere to be seen. I'm alone. The security guard is clearly not going to do anything and there's three of the guys there. And what if they decide to try and get me as well? The girl says one more time that she doesn't want to go with them. And before I realize what I'm doing, I'm getting to my feet and shouting, Hey! But the guy stops trying to push the girl into the car for a moment and looks at me. I say, she said she didn't want to go, dude. I start making my way across the street, even though my hands are shaking and my voice is probably not the most convincing. They say, she's our friend, she's just drunk and pretty cranky, it's all good and we're just going to take her home. He seems a bit nervous and not exactly angry, which makes me feel a bit better or less scared at least. Do you know them? I ask her and she just shakes her head no using the door as support to keep herself on her feet. Creep 1, the one who was trying to push her in the car, looks at me and to his friends who seem frustrated, but starts saying, come on man, let's just go, let's leave it. Creep 1, now looking a bit pissed, grabs the girl and pushes her towards me, getting in the car and they all leave. The girl nearly falls on her face, but I grab her and we walk back to the front of the club, my heart slowly going back to its normal rate. Only then do I realize that my friends had come out and were watching everything from across the street with confused faces. We all meet random people at clubs, at the door, walking down the street, so they probably thought that I'd met someone. I start asking her what had happened, if she's alone, where's all of her stuff, and she's just an incoherent mess, mumbling about losing track of her friends, her purse, she doesn't even know how she paid her tab to leave or anything. I ask for some help to the security guard, but he says that he can't leave his spot and he can't do anything. I explain what happened to my friends and they talk to the hostess about it, who begrudgingly goes and checks the lost and found. Her purse is thankfully there, minus the money that she had in her wallet, and we manage to call her parents as well. I talk to her mum because the girl can't explain anything and I promise to stay there until the mum comes to get her. 30 minutes later, the mum arrives and... I've never seen someone look so relieved and terrified at the same time. She thanks me and my friends as well profusely and offers us a ride home, but as we live the next town over, she just drives us to the subway station. In the middle of all the craziness, I forgot to exchange numbers with any of them, so I've never heard from that girl or her mum again, but I hope she learned to be more careful with just how much she drinks or who she talks to in clubs. Also, shame on her friends for not looking out for her or trying to find her when they realized that she was missing. 
though. Maybe they were all just as drunk as her. Who knows? I know what I did was probably reckless, but quite honestly, I wouldn't be able to just watch that car drive away and live with myself anymore. Please be safe when going out, guys. I live in a middle low-class neighborhood in the Caribbean. It's a quiet place where nothing ever really happens. The type of place that people go and retire to sip on pina coladas all day, really. However, a few houses next to mine lived a family that wasn't like the rest. They had the biggest house on the street and lived quite luxuriously. The kids would play with me, especially the smallest girl we all nicknamed Tiny. Tiny was about 5 when I was 11 and she was always at my house. I knew that my mum and the neighbours were concerned about a 5 year old being all day outside and not arriving at her house until midnight on school days but like I said it was a quiet place when nothing happened so no one got too worried. When Tiny turned 6 my parents threw a giant birthday party for her and all of the neighbourhood kids were invited. I wanted to go, they had bouncy houses and water slides and everything a kid would want to play with, but my parents didn't allow me to go and I never knew why but I supposed it was because my mum didn't know her mum. I remember feeling very sad too because everyone was there and I was playing alone at my house. After the birthday, things went back to normal and one day we were all playing and talking about what our parents did for work. We asked Tiny and her siblings but... And none of them knew what they did except that he travelled a lot and was always at meetings. I didn't pay much attention and we all just continued on with our day. But one night we were playing on the street when we started hearing loud pops coming from Tiny's house. I'll never forget that day as well. The neighbours, including my mum, came out rushing us inside yelling that it was gunshots. Some of us got into my house and we stayed there as my next door neighbour, a cop, ran towards Tiny's house. All we saw after the gunshots were a black van rushing down the street and almost killing a dog. Some men entered the house and Tiny and her siblings wanted to check out what was going on but everyone forbade them to go in. All I remember was a bunch of cops and ambulances a few minutes later. And a day after that I never saw Tiny or her siblings again. For a couple of months, the house just sat empty, but black fans and strange men kept coming into the neighborhood door to door asking for any information about the man and his children. No one in the neighborhood spoke about it. I know the cops asked me about Tiny and the kids and if they ever said something weird about their dad and their mum, but I was only 11 and more concerned about playing Mario Kart Wii than about what happened that night. Years passed and the story faded away. And now that I'm grown up though, I asked my neighborhood, the cop, what went down that night. There were some rumors that the guy actually died. He said that the night the man got a gun and emptied it into his skull and his wife was gravely wounded. She survived because he was a drug lord or something that was going to make a deal with the police to turn his rival gangs and some other people to the cops or something. The men in the van that were going door to door wanted to know where his kids and wife were to also shut them up. As for the kids, his oldest son was found dead a few hours away in the neighboring town. His car set ablaze. His other children are now living in other countries under witness protection programs. And I just hope that wherever Tiny is, that she's doing okay. And also that her family got the help that they needed. This happened three summers ago, but I remember the main events. To preface this, I've been on a shocking amount of dates and put myself in many foolish situations in the past. I'm a female and I was 25 at the time, if that matters. So, it started on the uh, Plenty of Fish app. I came across a cute guy and he was my type physically, kind of nerdy looking. On his profile, he had very adventurous photos of him hiking and traveling. He seemed really exciting to get to know and once he saw that I looked at his profile, he sent me a message. We flirted a bit back and forth and exchanged numbers, even though he lived about an hour away. He said on the app that he's never been to my city and didn't plan on it so we probably wouldn't meet. I respected his honesty, I don't like wasting my time. But one day, shortly after meeting him online, 
He texted me randomly saying that he's in my town on some work thing and invited me to a bar that he was at. I decided to meet up since I was already in the area and he said that he would actually pick me up. I was dumb, like I said, and I agreed, even though it was just over four blocks away. It took him way longer than it should have to get to me, and I honestly don't think he was actually ever at that bar. Once in POF Date's car, I noticed it was a rental and that it seemed like he had just gotten his license because he was a terrible driver. After driving in circles, he told me to pick a place, but not in the area because parking is impossible. I picked a place 15 minutes away by car with lots of parking, but also a busy place since I was with a stranger. And once there, he started pressuring me to drink. He insisted, in fact, and I'm not a huge drinker, but I enjoy pub-style bars. So I ended up caving, and I had a drink, and was again pressured to have another one. He was very pushy, too, and seemed really irritated that I wasn't going for it. Usually, I would end a day pretty quickly if I was ever mistreated, but he became charming enough to keep me there at least until we had done our date. I saw an old acquaintance at the bar and wanted my date to know that I knew him. In my head, I think I just wanted my date to know that someone could identify him. I'm not a paranoid person, but I think my subconscious was definitely on alert. After an hour of talking in the bar, I tell him that I'm ready to head out. He insisted that we go across the road to get a coffee. At the time, this seemed strange to me. Neither of us had much to drink and didn't need to sober up or anything. Coffee seems like a bit of an odd choice otherwise. But I entertained it. Once there, we sipped our drinks. And he told me that he rented a beautiful Airbnb in a nearby neighborhood that is more outside of the city and country in fact. He told me that he had it all to himself and invited me going on about how nice it was. I kept politely saying no and throwing around different excuses which he would counter with a reason for me to come. With no intention of actually going, I agreed, but only if he would drive me home to get overnight things. I felt like he wasn't going to let me say no, but he seemed happy with that answer, so we headed out. But while driving in the direction of my place, he said instead that he would stop at a 7-Eleven and grab me travel-sized toiletries so I wouldn't need anything. I felt panicked now because my plan was definitely not to go with him. Something about him was just off and I felt stupid for even getting back in this car to begin with. But immediately he turned his car and we were then headed toward a more country area. And literally... There aren't any 7-Elevens or open stores in the middle of nowhere. Then I mentioned that I'm actually thinking that I'd prefer not to stay with him and ask to be brought home. And he then said something that made me completely nervous to be around him for many longer. He said that he's sharing the Airbnb with the owners and said that they're really fun and sweet and that they drink and play games together. He definitely originally said that he had it all to himself. I knew that I didn't want to make it obvious that I was catching on to his lies, so I went along with it and said, oh, I have to wear my cute fluffy overnight PJs instead of my date dress because I'll be way more comfy, and then I spewed off a few more other things. I also mentioned that I need my medication and absolutely cannot miss a dose. Surprisingly, too, he turned around and as we drove back into the city, I felt a bit more calm, but at that point, definitely not safe. Finally, we get close to my place. I had no intention of letting him get close enough to know where I live. He was mentioning that he was going to come up to my apartment once we got there, but that was a huge hell no from me. I didn't know what I was about to do, but I looked for an opportunity to get out of the situation knowing that he could turn around and take me somewhere private in the matter of 15 minutes if he really wanted. We got to a stop sign where people were crossing, and thank God for this, because I quickly but calmly just got out and said, you know, I think I have a bit of a headache, I'll text you. I closed the car door and I went through a public park which was beside a building that his car wouldn't be able to drive into. I looked back to make sure that he wasn't going to get out of his car, following me too, and I could see him staring at me and he was furious. And I still have chills just thinking about his face that day. Within the hour he had blocked me on POF and 
Looking back, I think he possibly wanted to get me a coffee to put something in it, maybe. I think that he told me on POF that we would never meet, maybe to cover his ass or something, and I know that he didn't have good intentions with me. Since then, I actually met my fiancé on the same app and was super careful about dating, making sure that the first few dates are very public and to arrange my own transportation this time. In the end, I think I was actually pretty lucky. Alright, so uh, buckle up because this is going to get weird. This isn't something unknown amongst my friends and the people local to me, as I live in quite a small town. But in grade 9, I would have been about 13 or 14, I think, and I had no friends. I was, still am, kind of weird, and it always just threw people off. Making friends in high school was so difficult for me because I just refused to change who I was to fit in. During the second week of school, though, I met George in my English class. Our teacher had sat us together and we had begun talking and building a bit of a friendship. George was very nice and we actually had a lot in common. He had come from a different elementary school. It was odd because the people from his school commonly went to a different high school. Although he insisted that he wanted to go to this high school because there were certain classes that he wanted to take that the other school just didn't offer. After about a week of talking together during English though, he asked if I wanted to eat lunch with him. We had the same lunch period and he said that he noticed how often that I sat alone to eat. I thought it was a really nice gesture so I agreed. We ended up having lunch together for a while in fact but then I just kind of started making some new friends. I always invited him to eat lunch with a few of the other friends that I had made but he always just declined. And then one day in English class he passed me a note. This was very strange too since, I mean, we were sitting right next to each other. But the note said something like, I need to talk to you. Can we please sit alone together for lunch? I wrote back that I would sit with him and we hardly spoke the rest of the period. Obviously, I got really strange vibes from him. So, it's lunchtime and I see him sitting at the end of the row. Our cafeteria consisted of large harvest tables and benches it was not separate tables with chairs like you'd see in restaurants, but rather long tables with benches on either side. I go to sit down and he says, no, let's go outside to talk, so I agreed. He looked genuinely upset and I wanted to know what was going on. When we got outside, he led me over to sit on a curb in front of the school and started talking just really aggressively. He told me that it was unfair of me to make other friends when he was the one who befriended me first. He told me that I had to eat lunch with him because when I was alone, he ate lunch with me, so and now that he's alone, I was obligated to eat with him. It was a really bizarre conversation, and I explained that he could sit with me and my friends, and that that way there wouldn't be any issues, and he could even make some new friends. I told him that I had enough friendship to spread around and that he had nothing to be upset about. But what he said next just completely shook me. I could see the anger in his eyes. He grabbed my arm and said, I don't think you understand. You owe me this. You will sit with me. I completely freaked out at that point and I told him that we could sit alone together every other day. I just wanted to get away from him and go back inside where more people were around. After this day, I started getting weird messages to my emails as well. I'll never forget the first email that I was sent because it said, All women are Satan. The devil lives in you all. I didn't recognize the email address and assumed it was some sort of an internet troll trying to scare me. Remember chain emails? Yeah, I thought it was one of them. Then they started coming more frequently, all with the same type of message. Women are the devil. Satan lives in all women. I started getting scared, so I showed my friends these emails, and they agreed that it was weird, but also agreed that it was probably just some random person trying to scare people. But my one friend Stacy told me that she thought it was actually George. She had heard stories about why he came to our school instead of going to the high school that his grade 8 graduating class was going to. She told me that he was so obsessed with one of the girls in his class that her mum actually got a restraining order against him over the summer. I told her that that just sounded insane and I didn't believe it. 
And so I was still having lunch with George on alternate days and we were still friendly during English class, but I really wanted to distance myself from him if I'm being honest. After Christmas break though, our schedules changed for second semester and I was really happy about this because I knew that I'd have a different lunch period than George and we wouldn't have English together anymore and I thought that I could slowly disassociate myself from him. But I was very wrong. He started leaving notes in my locker, confessing his undying love and explaining that we were meant to take over the world together, which at the time I thought was very nice of him to say, but the feelings were definitely not mutual. Eventually I had to tell him that enough was enough though. I explained that he was overwhelming me and that I needed a little space for my friendship. He seemed to understand. He didn't get upset or yell. He just agreed to give me my space, which lasted about two days before the emails started getting worse. And he started actually to threaten my life, telling me that they knew where I lived and the school that I went to. I went straight to my mum when this started happening and... I know that I should have done this sooner, but my mum called the police and the police informed the school and the school looked up the email in their records and found out that it was George sending the nasty emails all along. George was suspended and wouldn't even look at me anymore. I was quite honestly relieved though. Now, one year after we graduated high school, George and his mother went for a drive. And while she was driving, he actually stabbed her over 100 times. He had some sort of a psychotic break and when the police found him he tried saying that it was a car accident but when they questioned him about all the stab wounds he admitted to killing her and trying to release the devil from his mother's soul. He pleaded insanity against the murder of his mother and he was actually found not criminally responsible for the murder. So, the only word that I can really use to describe it is thing. It was and still is the creepiest thing that I've ever encountered in real life. I've always thought that the book series Goosebumps was genius because any time I get actually genuinely scared, I get goosebumps. And remembering the night that I saw it, it's something I really don't like to do often. is just giving me these goosebumps again anyway. My childhood home was a house at the tip of a cul-de-sac at the end of a winding neighborhood road. It was a really nice place to grow up as there were footpaths snaking through the woods all around the development, allowing my friends and I to venture through the neighborhood as we pleased. The paths were especially useful to me as well as they connected right from the back of my house all the way to the bus stop at the beginning of the neighborhood and just a brief walk through the woods away. Since I grew up taking this path to and from school, and since I got home late due to extracurriculars a lot, I grew accustomed to walking in the woods at night. But those were my woods and I wasn't really scared. I smoked with my buddies in these woods too and had times with some girls there as well and it was kind of like an extension of my backyard. But now, I won't ever, and I mean ever, go back in there again. I'm not really scared of much and... Mind you, I was completely sober and rested during this story. It's rare for me to get scared, but it's a detail that I specifically remember. But anyway, enough exposition. Here's what actually happened. So I was coming home from an especially late night working on our school's competition robot, FRC, and taking my normal path home. And since I was a freshman and I lived a three minute drive from my school, I could walk home by using the community paths, crossing into my neighborhood and then using my path to get to my backyard. But normally I listened to music, but I had stupidly left my earbuds at the workshop after the doors locked, so I was walking to the soundtrack of chirping crickets and cicadas. It was an especially noisy night as well, with wind blowing that created a shallow whistling tone of sorts. It wasn't bothering me though, and I was making good headway into the night. Around the point when the poorly lit community path bisects with my street is where it started to get just strange. So my entire street has lights, evenly spaced about a thousand feet apart. They are always on with multiple backups in place, and I've never seen them even once so much as flicker. And well, 
But when I got to the end of the community path, I began to look both ways to cross the street. My neighborhood's entrance is a long downward slope that bottoms out to a bridge above a little creek and begins to slightly ascend around a curve and out of sight. The path that I needed to get to was past this bridge and to the left of the edge of the woods. As I finished checking both ways and was about to step into the street, I saw a silhouette standing under the light at the very bottom of the slope. And it seemed to be just completely still, like a statue of a shadow or something. And as I begin to get a bit more detail, the light right above it just went out. This alone really freaked me out and I was immediately paralyzed, standing at the top of the street looking down into the impossibly dark void that just swallowed the light source in my path, with goosebumps shooting along my taut skin. I considered walking through, but as that thought crossed my mind... So did the one wondering about what the ever-loving shit was both under and controlling that light. I then thought that maybe it was a maintenance worker just messing with me. Either way, when the second light, the one that was closer to me, went out, I didn't care what it was. I was not happy. I took a moment to collect myself though and to reassure myself that I wasn't in some sort of a fantasy world. There's no such thing as Wendigos or aliens or some crazy stuff coming for me like that. So I took a deep breath and I crossed the street. I got across and I slowed a bit when exiting the safety of the streetlight, still on. When my spider senses were just going absolutely berserk as I walked into that Vanta Black space. I was so relieved when I got to the fourth working light which was at the beginning of my path and as I began to walk that path, something just inside of me told me to not turn around and to just simply run. And stupidly, I didn't listen. I turned back to the light that I had just crossed and in the middle of the globe was just an incredibly unnerving sight. It was hunched and it was a hooded figure, seemingly seven feet tall and with this impossibly thin frame standing on four legs and if i wasn't scared before now i was petrified i swear to you that i thought death itself was coming for me but another second of contemplating was all it took for me to see it move slightly in my direction and my decision to begin a full tilt sprint to my house was now made but the scariest part of this entire story was probably not the fact that i couldn't tell who or what this thing was but it was the fact that as I began to run home, I could definitely hear something running after me. I've never cried so hard in my life running down that path in that night. And with each step that I took, I heard a subsequent two thumps of weight pushing aside the rocks that lined the path behind me. I was hysterical, going insane, too afraid to look back, just running faster than I've ever run before. As I turned the final curve in the path, I heard the frequency of the steps behind me slow, and as I hopped the deck and ripped open the side door, flinging myself inside and locking the door, I looked outside the glass panes that saw back out onto the path, and in the night, just barely illuminated by the moon, that thing was just staring right back at me. The only way I can describe this thing too is like, someone took a photo and cut out a silhouette of the monster from the village or something, and just way bigger than that, and put it right in front of me. I couldn't even move a millimeter once I got inside because I was just completely frozen on the spot. But after multiple minutes of me staring at it unblinkingly, it turned and just began to slowly, nonchalantly, walk away. As it trotted out of view, I ran to every entrance of my house, locking everything, and I ran to my room where I subsequently broke down for a good three hours before exhausting myself and eventually just falling asleep. My parents were too freaked out by my experience and incoherent rambling to believe me, so they waved it off as just a sleep-deprived paranoia thing or something. I was pretty mad at them for a while about that, I'll admit, and they always asked me why I stopped using that trail, and every time that I told them, they just laughed at me. But to me, it obviously just wasn't funny at all. You can believe me or not, but this is one of the most vivid memories I have. I just wish that I could project this mental image to you. 
If eyes could take pictures, I know that all of you would be just as scared as I was that night. My dad told me about this incident that happened in the early 50s when he was a young child. I'm sharing it here with how it was related to me. So, it was in the early 50s. My dad couldn't have been much older than 5 or 6 years old when it happened. He grew up on a large family farm that was fairly isolated. The nearest neighborhood was at least a quarter mile away through rolling wooded hills. There was no electric service on the farm back then, and they didn't get phones until the summer of 1984, so they were effectively on their own. One day, Grandpa had sent my uncle to the feed mill to collect payment for that year's harvest. He was told to get it in cash. Grandpa wanted to pay that year's taxes and then deposit the rest in the bank. My uncle brought the money home, and that night at around 2am, they were awakened by a car parked on the property with its headlights aimed at the house. Grandpa rolled out of bed and crawled along the floor to my uncle and dad's bedroom and woke my uncle up. In almost complete darkness, they ran down the stairs. My uncle ran out the back door and grandpa ran out of the front. Grandpa threw the front door open and ran outside so fast that he pretty much leapt over the back steps and went to confront the guy. The driver of the car was already most of the way to the house. He saw grandpa coming with my uncle close behind and he turned and hauled us and Grandpa wasn't far behind. He made it to his car, and he was trying to drive away, and Grandpa was grabbing the steering wheel, trying to stop him. But eventually, he managed to break loose, and Grandpa chased him a short distance down the road, but he finally got away. At that point, Grandpa and my uncle noticed a second car at the end of the block speeding away as well. The intruders had managed to get away that night, but thankfully, no one was hurt. The next day, Grandpa and my uncle reported what had happened to the sheriff, and the sheriff pretty much succinctly told them to buy some rifles, because if it happens again, do what you have to do to defend yourselves. And the next stop they made was to the hardware store to buy said rifles, one for each of my uncles and one for my grandpa. There was never a repeat of the incident, as far as my dad knows, and the late night visitors were never caught. This happened a few years ago when I was still living with my mum and I had borrowed her car to go see my boyfriend for the evening. It was around midnight when I got back to my neighbourhood so the roads were pretty much empty and that's when I noticed this dirty, run-down, rusted white utility van that my maintenance guy would drive following me. I never saw the driver's face but I got this immediate sinking feeling in my stomach because something just felt wrong about this van. Now, I was only 20 at the time, but I knew better than to just drive straight to my house and letting this person know exactly where I live, no matter how desperately I wanted to just go home and ignore it. But I also wasn't 100% sure that they were actually following me yet. I didn't want to jump to conclusions just because it was late and I was alone and being paranoid and all that. So I drove to a shopping complex a few minutes out of the way that's well lit and has a public library to see if I was followed there. I thought that I lost the van but decided to wait in the parking lot for a few minutes because I just had a bad feeling that I just couldn't shake. Sure enough, the van showed up and was driving in just random circles around the parking lot looking for me by the looks of things. That scared me quite a bit, so I drove towards the big mall here that's always got security or police presence because it was the midway point between where I was and where I lived. I parked in a very well lit, although empty, 24 hour McDonald's parking lot where I had a great view of the roads and the mall, but I wasn't super easy to spot as well, and I just waited to see if the van showed up looking for me. And it did. And of course, this would be the one time security and the cops are nowhere to be found, which was half the reason I decided to head there in the first place. Realizing that whoever was driving this van was 100% actively following me in the middle of the night, I knew that driving home was not an option, and that's a terrifying realization. Luckily, the police station is just a few minutes away from where I was, so I try and discreetly drive away, hoping the van hasn't noticed me yet. 
and I wasn't that lucky because it wasn't long before the van was back in my rearview mirror. At this point, I'm panicking pretty hard and my anxiety is really high. I finally pulled into the police station parking lot and seconds later, the van came to a stop in the middle of the road for no more than a few seconds. I'm guessing just long enough for them to realize where I led them, and they just took off immediately, pretty quickly as well. I did make it home safe and without seeing the van again not long after, but this whole ordeal took up at least an hour of my night. It was after 1am by the time that I made it home and I was pretty much terrified the whole night. I don't know what this guy's specific intention was, but honestly I don't need to know. I know that it was nothing good and that I likely avoided a very bad situation. If you think that someone is following you, it's not stupid or paranoid to make sure that you aren't right, because who knows what might have happened if I had led them to my house, or gotten out of my car. So me and my friend Jacob go out biking in a forest near my house because it's pretty big and it has some nice trails. We'd been biking around for, uh, I'd say about an hour when we realized that we were actually kind of lost. So we stopped to try and figure out where we were at. He was trying the map app on his phone when I noticed a house not too far off the trail. My friend's phone wasn't having any luck with connecting, so we decided to walk over to the house to check if someone could point us in the right direction. We knocked on the door, and honestly, just like a horror movie, and I know that's cliche, but this is exactly what happened. The door just creaked open by itself. Well, we walked in asking if anyone was there, and then we realized that the place was empty. It was mostly furnished, but... It looked pretty old and the fridge was rancid. My friend finds a staircase leading up to a floor and we decided to go up and check that part of the place out. The second that I put my foot on that staircase, I felt just nauseous. I almost fell over because of just how bad I felt in fact and my friend helps me make it out of the place but I collapse outside on the ground and I start vomiting just violently. My friend is trying to help me from falling into my vomit and once I was done I sat back up and I just tried to get some air. And that was when my friend turned around and just mumbled, holy crap dude. I turned around at this and the entire house was gone. Like there wasn't even dirt and stuff that proved the house even existed. I mean it looked like the house was never even there in the first place. There was even a tree growing in a spot where the corner of the place was. I didn't know what to say, so I just sat there, just staring at the ground. That was when I realized that I'd taken a picture of the place on my phone, so I pulled that out trying to see if I'd actually taken a picture or not. And it was just a picture of the ground, just covered in dead leaves and grass. We decided that moving was better than staying there, and after probably half an hour or so, we found our way back to the trails that we knew. I've got no idea what the hell that was, but I'm wondering, has anyone else seen anything like this? I can't be the only one, right? If you guys have had any similar experiences or know of any similar stories, I would love to hear them, so please let me know in the comments section below. Oh, and uh, I actually returned there not too long ago trying to get some pictures for you guys, but after what happened when we tried going back to find the spot, I honestly just don't think that it's worth the risk anymore. This is because we went into the forest at uh, maybe 11 or 11.20ish am. We looked about for what could have only been about two hours tops, and we left because we were starting to get hungry. He turns on his car and we both immediately noticed that the time read 5pm, which means that we were in there for roughly 6 hours, and yet we barely felt it. So since then, me and my friend have pretty much agreed to forget it ever happened in the first place, and just steer clear of that forest entirely. At age 14, my parents sent me to a military school in Virginia for pretty much bad behavior. Cadets stayed at the school throughout the school year except for a few weekends and holiday leaves and whatnot. The school opened in 1898, 
and many buildings on the campus have been around for well over a hundred years, like the barracks that I slept in, though several buildings throughout the years had burned down, like one such occurrence when an accidental fire burned down the Delta Company barracks in 1924. But the academic building was built around 1915. It was two stories tall with the second floor being full of classrooms. But my experience took place on the first floor which featured a handful of offices for facility offices, a computer lab as well and a large room that had two large swinging doors that opened into a study hall meant to accommodate roughly 75 students at any given time. But one aspect of my new life as a cadet was called guard duty and every day three cadets were randomly selected to be on guard duty. The guards had to wake up an hour earlier than everyone else at 5am and you'd wake up, get dressed in uniform and meet the other two guards at the academic hall. But once the guards got to the building, they were supposed to do a walkthrough on both floors to make sure nothing was out of place and check that nobody was inside. After the walkthrough, you'd sit by the phone in the first floor hallway and take calls from anyone happening to call in. So I'd been at the boarding school for a few months when I was assigned my first guard duty. So the next morning I woke up early and I got dressed as quietly as possible to avoid waking my roommate. It was pouring outside so I put on my rain jacket on top of my uniform and walked through the dark to the academic building. Usually guards would meet up outside the building but since it was raining hard I just decided to go inside by myself. I waited inside the dark building for the other guards to show up and after about 10 minutes I started to get worried because they still had not shown up and I was concerned that a facility officer might come early and see that I had not done my job. So I walked up the stairs and checked every classroom and also the creepy bathroom that looked like it hadn't been updated since the 1940s and nothing was out of place. So I made my way downstairs to check the offices, the study hall and other rooms I thoroughly opened every door and walked through every room. Once again, nothing was out of place and no one was inside. In fact, everything seemed pretty much in order in the dark building. And so I sat down in the hallway next to the phone. But after a few minutes, I felt the weirdest sensation. The building had begun to kind of shake softly. I could feel the vibrations in my body and see the small table next to me shake ever so much. I sat there completely frightened by whatever was occurring in front of my eyes, but the rumbling abruptly stopped a few moments later and I took a big sigh of relief. But then I started hearing noises from the study hall room, the doors to which were only 10 feet away from me. It started off just barely legible and I couldn't tell what I was hearing from that room, though it seemed like it was getting louder and soon I started to hear what sounded like whispering... It kept getting louder and louder until I could hear what sounded like dozens and dozens of voices inside the room. And after a few moments, I could actually hear what they were saying. But it was as if many conversations were taking place all at once in a kind of chaotic sense. And I could hear laughter and comments like, pass me the answers to the math homework and stuff like that. This was a room that I'd just been in a short while ago and... There was no other entrance into it other than the swinging doors that I was sitting right next to. It had been completely empty short of all the desks and other items throughout the room but now I was hearing what I can only describe as a room full of voices. I sat there paralyzed with fear while hearing all of this and then I began to also hear a tapping noise coming from around the room. It sounded almost as if someone was hitting a ruler against a desk. The tapping sound began to move around the room while all the other voices continued, when suddenly the tapping stopped, but what was so much worse was that I heard something scream, sit down and shut up, it's study time. It was incredibly loud and unmistakably like an instructor was in there screaming at a, a room full of cadets. As soon as whoever or whatever finished screaming, the study hall fell completely silent. I sat in my chair wanting to bolt out of the building, but I was honestly just too scared to move. Plus, I'd have to pass by the doorway to the study hall to actually get out of the building. But my heart was pounding in my chest and I was breathing incredibly hard. I was terrified that whatever was in that room would realize that I was there. And then the building softly began to shake again, almost as if whatever was taking place was coming to an end. 
few minutes passed as I sat there in my chair in silence. I couldn't hear anything anymore coming from the study hall, and I began to feel slightly better about the circumstances, though I still had not built up the nerve to actually make a run for it yet. But then, the building started to shake again, and I could hear the ruler tapping noise start up again in the room. And this time, it was clear that it was making its way to the door that led to me. It was moving fast and growing louder. It had almost gotten to the swinging doors when I sprang up without thinking and my survival instincts kicked in and I sprinted out of the building as fast as I had ever run before. Now, outside, I made my way through the dark back to my barracks and just as I was getting near the barracks, one of the guards was sleepily walking out of the barracks and the other students were all still fast asleep. I calmed my nerves and I walked up to him. He hadn't seen me running in the rain yet, and for some reason I didn't tell him what I had experienced. I walked with him back to the academic building as he explained how he had overslept, and we walked inside. He made a beeline to the study hall room, opened the swinging doors, walked in, and tossed his backpack onto his assigned desk. I followed him inside, apprehensively, and when I got in, the room was still empty. So, to start off, this is a collection of stories from my old house that I lived in my entire life, up until three years ago. There was a lot that happened to me and my family in the house, but these are the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. So, before I begin, let me explain how my bedroom is set up and give some backstory on my family. My parents used to be paranormal investigators and were a part of a ghost hunting team in Arizona. They had many cases but actually stopped when they dealt with something so bad that it really messed them up. And so, the paranormal really isn't anything new to us. Growing up, I believed in ghosts because of what I'd seen and learned, but now that I'm an adult, I'm sort of skeptical about everything. Though I have had a lot of stuff happen to me that I really can't explain logically. So yeah, this is one of those stories. To explain my house, my bedroom was upstairs. Attached to my bedroom was a Jack and Jill bathroom, connected to my sister's bedroom. Both doors locked from inside of the bathroom, and one night, my younger sister and I were sitting in my bedroom. I had a bunk bed set up so that the bottom was a desk and I would sleep at the top. At this time, I was on the top bunk just playing on my phone, and my little sister was at the desk drawing. At some point though, we started to hear the bathroom doorknob move as if someone was trying to open it, but it couldn't because it was locked. I told my little sister to go and open it because whoever was on the other side was stupid because it locks from that side. She goes over and tells me that the door is locked, and before she got over to the door, it just stopped moving. We just kind of shrugged it off, thinking that it might have been our older sister messing with us, and we went back to doing whatever it was that we were doing. After a while, we decided to head back downstairs. I turn off my lights, and I come down off my bunk bed. We started heading down the hallway, and I could hear my parents fighting, and so I told my little sister that I'd join her down there in a minute, because, to be honest, I didn't want to deal with my parents. So I went over to my elder sister's bedroom, assuming she was in there because all the lights were on from what I could see under a doorway. As I approached a door, I started to hear what sounded like a, a scrubbing noise. Honestly, the best way I could describe it is like someone was going to town on deep cleaning my bathtub. I thought it was weird since my sister literally doesn't clean anything, especially not our bathtub. I originally went to open a door and it was locked, so I knocked on the door and waited. And nothing. I then banged on the door thinking that she probably just couldn't hear me because of the loud noise coming from the bathroom and I shouted, Kaylin, open up. Why are you scrubbing something at like 8pm? And I again heard no reply. After a few more bangs on the door, I started to get annoyed. That's when the scrubbing sound stopped thinking that she was finally coming, I waited by the door when suddenly the door just started shaking as if someone on the other side was scratching at it with both hands, and it was the same noise that I could hear in the bathroom. I could tell that it was shaking too because I could see the light peeking through the openings every time the door was hit. At first, I assumed maybe one of the dogs got locked in there on accident, but 
Then I thought my sister was probably just messing with me, so I banged on the door and yelled something like, stop messing around and let me in. The noise continued for maybe a second and that's when I banged on the door once more and suddenly everything just stopped. A few seconds of silence and there was a loud bang on the door in response. I thought at this point, okay, screw this and slowly backed away. I yelled to my mum who was downstairs and said, mum, is Kaylin in her room? And she replied, no, she's in the garage with the chickens. We had moved our chickens to the garage because it was too cold out for them and we felt our chicken coop just wasn't good enough to keep them warm. I then ran downstairs as fast as I could and asked, are you sure? And she said, I don't know, go look. So I did. I opened the door and there she was, sitting on the couch with one of our chickens. I then explained to her everything that happened and she was just as confused as me, so we decided to head up together to check it out. I told her the door was locked, so she was going to push it open. Her door kind of sucked, so with enough force she could open it, even when locked. She went to push her door open and nearly fell into the room because suddenly her door was just unlocked again. All the lights were on, the closet and the bathroom doors wide open. We kind of just stood there for a moment and wondered what the hell happened. And at that moment, we heard the scraping noise in the bathroom and... We both just ran out and downstairs so fast that my sister slipped and ran into the table because my mum was mopping. So, in the end, we were not really sure what happened, but it never happened again after that. The next story, to give some backstory again, and you can believe it or not, but my sister has always been sensitive to the paranormal. Ever since she was a baby, in fact, because... Growing up, she'd tell my parents that she had a family friend who passed away or she would play with our great-grandma Jessie who passed away when we were babies. Even as a teenager, she would tell us about figures that she would see and stuff like that. And anyway, the story goes like this. My sister comes into my room at night at about 30 minutes after I took a shower. She had come in to yell at me, all my lights were off. So she comes in, yells at me, then goes back into her room. She had heard me laughing from downstairs and yelled down the stairs for me. I replied and she asked me how long I'd been down there and I told her about 30 minutes and then asked why. She just went silent and said, never mind, but I knew that something was up. She didn't tell me for a few days, even though I kept pressing her about it. And eventually she told me that when she came into my room to yell at me, she saw a figure clear as day laying on my bunk bed. The figure even turned around to look at her as if it was looking over its shoulder while laying on its side. She told me that she didn't want to freak me out because I told her that sometimes when I sleep on my bed, I feel like there's something there with me on the top bunk. And after that, I had sleeping problems and it really creeped me out. I hated that room and... I hated sleeping in that room and it just gave me a bad vibe every time I would go in there and so that really just turned me off from wanting to sleep in there. I 100% believe my sister too because of the fact that she was so freaked out she didn't tell me for a few days. I had a lot of things happen to me in this house and I'm really glad that I don't live there anymore. Now the next one is a little bit stupid but it was a big deal to me at the time and I think it adds to the context. So the story starts like this. When I was around 16 or 17, I had a bedroom and in my bedroom was a dresser, my bunk bed, closet and bathroom and I had a bunch of tacks sitting on my dresser in the plastic case that it came in. At one time, I walked into my bedroom about to head into my bathroom and the tacks were just all over the floor. I was like, damn it, who knocked this shit onto the floor again and didn't bother to pick it up? I went to my sister's room our bedrooms were connected with the Jack and Jill bathroom, remember? And I thought that maybe she knocked it over while going into her bedroom since my dresser was right next to my bathroom. So I went in and I asked her and she said that she hadn't gone into my room all day. I was like, whatever, she's lying because I sure didn't knock it over. But a few days pass and the same thing happens again. A few days later and the same thing. I come in and the tacks are just all over my floor again. Annoyed, I pick them up and put them into a little glass box that I had so that they wouldn't fall off my dresser again. 
The next day I come in and my attacks are on the floor again. I was starting to get pissed off at this point because it just kept happening and I thought someone was messing with me. I asked my sister and she swore that it wasn't her. I asked my mum and my dad and neither of them knew that I even had tacks in there so I put them back in the glass box and pushed them to the end of my dresser against the mirror. But as you've probably ascertained by now, it just kept happening. At first it was every few days but then it was like once a day and eventually it happened twice a day. My whole family knew about it too because I just complained about it so much. We jokingly named it the Tack Ghost and I've called it that ever since. Eventually I kind of got used to it so when I'd come in I'd sort of just sigh and outwardly say are you kidding me again? Don't you have something better to do? My family kind of made fun of it and didn't really believe me too much and I was getting pretty mad. I wanted to test something so I put my tacks into the glass box once more and I placed a candle on top of it. The next day I came home from school and guess what? Tacks are all over my bedroom floor, not just in a pile in front of my dresser and the damn candle is straight across the room with the lid off. I kind of freaked out over this and I told everyone and they were like, well, then take them out of the room, but I was determined to prove to them that I wasn't just making it up. So Christmas comes around and I had a friend who was living with us at the time and told him that we were going to test this stuff out so he would see that I wasn't lying. After opening presents and cards, I bring all my stuff upstairs and he comes with me. I play some of the heavier items on my dresser and I put my cards and money on top of the pile. I outwardly said, don't touch my money to the ghost, and then I looked at my friend and I said, we'll come back later and see if anything happens. A few hours pass and we go upstairs to check and nothing had happened. After a little while, I honestly thought that maybe nothing was going to actually happen, until my friend and I go upstairs to check and my money is across the room on the floor. Now, the air wasn't on and the windows weren't open and there just wasn't any sort of wind that could have sent them that far across my room. My friend and I screamed and ran downstairs and we told everyone and I put the tacks in a drawer on top of my dresser and after that it never happened again. So this will be the last story because I don't want this getting too long. So at the time that this happened I was living with three out of five of my sisters it was my older sister Heather, Callan, and my younger sister Beverly. Like I said in the story above too, my family has always kind of just been in touch with the paranormal. So, my older sister Caitlin, the one who was sensitive to the paranormal as well, kept telling us that she felt that there was a ghost boy living in a closet. We kind of just shrugged it off and didn't really think too much about it because it was kind of normal for us that these types of things happened. A few weird things happened around our house and in a room that we couldn't really explain, but they were all small and not worth going into detail about. But one morning, my sister woke up and we all talked about our dreams, and my older sister Heather told us that she had a weird dream about an older woman coming to her and asking not to tell our parents that she was staying out of her house because she was scared or something. And that was it. That was the dream. But at the same time, my sister Kaylin kind of just looked at her, shocked, and told us that she had dreamt of a boy in her closet asking her if it was okay for her family to stay with us for a bit and asked her not to tell my parents that they were there because they didn't want to be sent away. We all were surprised and freaked out that they had the exact same dream but with different people. We told our parents who said that they sort of felt bad, that they felt scared, and that they wouldn't send them away. A long while passes and... At this time, my parents had a radio show and would interview a lot of people in the paranormal field. They would talk to psychics and things like that, and they made a lot of friends in the paranormal field. One day, my parents are in this Skype call with one of their paranormal sensitive psychic friends and ask my sister Kaylin to talk to her because she might relate to her, and long story short, this girl had told my sister about the family staying with us and told us that... They had apparently passed on when we visited a church to celebrate one of my family members being baptized. I'm not religious, but some people in my family are. And my sister started bawling her eyes out because she was so shocked that this girl knew all of this and 
at this time, she sort of felt validated that a stranger was telling her, and her parents too, something that she had experienced this whole time. And my parents were just as shocked because they hadn't even spoken about this to anyone but people within our house. So, to end the story, we never heard anything about the family again, and I hope they're doing well wherever they are, but it was a trip, let me tell you. Let me start this off by giving some background information about myself before I actually share my encounter. So, I'm a 24-year-old female that has spent a majority of my life outdoors camping and hiking through wild terrain. I've also been studying zoology and biology for the last six years and have been in close proximity to bobcats, mid-hunts, protected mama bears, and even territorial elk. I'm disclosing this because all of these experiences have been quite scary, but... I have never been more terrified than I was the night that I encountered an unknown entity in northern Arizona. So, in March of 2018, I decided to go on a back road drive with a friend of mine at about 2am. That area is well known for almost zero light pollution, which makes the sky almost mesmerizing on a clear night, which that night was. The area I was driving in was thick pine forest and I was on alert because of the large elk in the region. After about an hour, my friend and I made it to a paved road leading back towards home. The road was a T-shape and we were stopped at a stop sign, taking a moment to update our playlist. I'm about to shift out of park when I look about 30 feet in front of me. I'm facing the pine tree line that my headlights are illuminating and the tree line sat along a small 5 foot ridge that was parallel to the road that I was going to turn onto when... I noticed what looked like a, a door-sized block straight out of my view that appeared to be warped, sort of. It looked like one of those portals in space movies, but less intense, and I could still see a distorted image through the forest behind the block. I could still see a distorted image of the forest behind the block. I sat there for a while before I told my friend that I thought that I was hallucinating. To clarify, too, I was definitely not under the influence of any substance. But I was definitely concerned and was about to suggest that they drive instead since my vision seemed to be impaired. That is, until they told me that I wasn't hallucinating because they were witnessing the same thing. Without looking away from the block, we both described the same exact image, so at this point I was actually freaked out. We're pretty logical people, I'd like to think, and so we didn't want to jump to any conclusions. I mean, there must be a rational answer, right? So, of course, we do what sane people do on a dark back road. We put my car in park and we get out of the vehicle. I know, not smart. We kept my headlights on as we crossed the road heading towards the distorted block and we noticed that as we moved, the portal wasn't moving from its original spot. So, it ruled out any kind of fumes possibly interfering. As I reached the ridge that the portal sat on top of, my friend stopped. He said that it didn't feel right and that he thought that we should go back to the car. He's smarter than me. At that point, I was more intrigued than scared and I was already within 10 feet of this thing, so might as well finish the job. I started walking up the 5 feet incline when I was filled with the most intense dread that I had ever experienced. I could almost reach out and touch the warped doorway when my foot softly planted itself directly in front of me. And at that exact moment, the most horrendous noise erupted. It honestly sounded almost as if someone had dropped a metal tank straight out of the air. It was the loudest metallic crash that I had ever heard in my life. I was startled by the noise, obviously, and lost my footing and slipped down the ridge, and caught my footing right as I was next to my friend. We both looked at each other in scared confusion when the night air filled with what sounded like three dozen coyotes calling each other. I'll admit that it's pretty common for coyotes to call out in groups. They're kind of known for it, but what's unusual about this specific situation was that the three dozen coyote house sounded like they were screeching in our ears. It was so loud, in fact, that we had to cover our ears as we ran to the car. I felt like I was about to be attacked by all of them, and they were about to jump on me by how close the screams were. As I was running back across the street, I was looking around desperately for the coyotes to determine just how many there were, but there was not a single one in sight. 
As soon as we slammed and locked the doors of the car, the noise that was almost debilitating the moment before just completely went silent. Nothing, not even a single peep. I looked up as I was shifting into drive and saw that the warped portal was now gone. Confirmed with my friend that he no longer saw it too and we just drove the hell out of there. We got home in record time and we ran inside my home and pretty much discussed what happened until the sun came up. Now, we both encountered the same exact phenomena out there on that road. We both saw the warped apparition and we heard the same noises. We were both filled with a nauseating dread and were hysterical and what we had experienced. We couldn't solve it logically and we were desperate for answers the next day when we started speaking with some friends who grew up in the local Navajo reservation. When we shared the experience, they were all convinced that we had encountered a skinwalker. When I first heard the term, I was sure that they were just kidding, but they truly believe in this, and they grew up with warnings from their elders, so the fear that they have for this thing is real. Some would even walk with blessed ash on their foreheads to discourage skinwalker encounters, a sort of protection charm, if you will. So I looked into other skinwalker encounters and it's a real inconsistent mess of stories out there but I've come across a few that are eerily similar to my own experience. Other people who don't think that I'm crazy have suggested that it's a possible alien encounter. Their reason being the metallic crash that we heard. I'm not as convinced with this possibility but I've definitely got an open mind. And I mean, who really knows what the hell happened? But if you have any insights or questions or redirections in these theories, then please share them with me. Of course, no one's really going to know for sure what I encountered, but I know that whatever it was in that forest was nothing that I've ever studied or come across before. And I knew that I was in the presence of something supernatural or the like, or at least something that was very dangerous. I know a lot of people who have had weird and unexplained things happen to them in the high desert regions. And now I know just why they don't go out alone anymore. So I work at a church as an office admin. I'm not a member or even a believer, but it's a good job. This often means that if the minister is out ministering, I'm completely alone in a very large building. Usually I like to be able to work with nobody bothering me and I relish the days when nobody drops in or calls. And it was one of those quiet days and I needed to take a stack of materials into the chapel. We never have lights on unless we're just using a space and I usually don't bother turning them on for the chapel or anything. I mean, there are stained glass windows anyway so there's enough light to see. And it's really pretty too with just the window light coming in. So, the area where I'm dropping off some printed materials is up a few steps on the raised area where the choir and the organ and the pulpit are. I drop the stuff, I turn around, and I'm just about to walk back when I notice something. Now, this is a pretty old church with pretty massive wooden pews, so if you're walking straight down the aisle, you only see the backs of them sticking up and whatnot, and you don't really see the seats or the ground between the pews. But from up on the platform area, there's enough of an area that I can see a coat lying on the floor between two rows of pews. I'm not really surprised. We have a lot of people forget stuff on Sundays. Someone once forgot their teeth there. That was a fun one to look for. So I'm heading down the aisle, looking down each row of the pews to find the one the jacket was laying under when I realize that it isn't actually a jacket because there's a man lying on the floor. Now, it's important to note that there are three aisles in this church, the main center one and two side ones. I always use the side one closest to the office out of habit. It's dumb, but I just feel silly walking down the white center aisle of a church. The aisles are carpeted, and I wear black, dressy sneakers to work and tend to walk quietly. The man on the floor is facing the center aisle, and I freeze and stare at him, expecting him to sit up and say something, but... I realize that he hasn't noticed me yet. He's kind of wiggling his feet, not a lot, just kind of rocking his shoes on the floor, so I'm pretty sure that he's awake, or at least alive. And quite honestly, I have no idea what to do. I've got severe anxiety and CPTSD, and I've long known my fight or flight response is freeze like a dumbass. So I'm just staring at this guy on the floor trying to think of something to say. 
I'm still not sure what I should have said. I mean, hello sir, wouldn't you rather have a seat or something? But as I'm thinking this, the main doors to the church opened. I'd literally forgotten that Paul, one of the members of the congregation, was coming in to do some painting work today. He spots me frozen in the chapel and comes in. He pokes his head in and hollers, Hey, uh, I'm going to start working out front, okay? At me. And as soon as Paul started talking, the guy on the floor started craning his head around to see what was going on, or to see who Paul was talking to, I assume. But of course, this man has now spotted me, and my stupid brain still has my jaw wired shut and my feet glued to the floor. The man on the floor starts absolutely screaming. I've honestly never heard a grown man full out scream like that in real life. It didn't sound scared or angry to me. He wasn't trying to make words out at all, it was honestly just noise. He scrambles to his feet though and starts running down the aisle to the door and slams into it. He charges right out of the building, right past Paul, who just kind of stands aside and watches the man run off. We just look at each other for a long minute before Paul comes over and asks if I'm okay and what that was all about. I have no idea and I look down and the man on the floor is left behind a backpack. Me and Paul lock the outside doors and take it to the office. I call the cops and they say that they'll send someone to collect the bag and look around the neighborhood but they don't sound really bothered. Paul decides to look in the backpack and I try telling him not to but I'm frankly curious as well. Inside the backpack is a Bible, several disposable plastic spoons covered in foil, an empty bag of hand sanitizer, a roll of plastic wrap, one sock and a pack of crayons. The Bible? It's one of ours and he's colored it. Not like a child or how you'd think a crazy person would either. It's not all scribbles all over and he didn't draw pictures or write in it or circle things. He has literally colored the words. Like going along one sentence at a time, coloring words or parts of words different colors. It kind of looks like uh, highlighting in different colors but with crayons. And with the sections of different colors changing randomly as well. There's no blank gaps so all the pages he's gone through look like a series of rainbow stripes and it's actually really neatly done. He's gotten through the Old Testament up to the book of Ezra, which is about a third of the way through the whole Bible which means that he's been coloring for a very long time. And this is what concerns me. How long had he been in there to color that far? Or did he come in before and take a Bible with him and then come back? And of course, what was he doing laying on the floor and why did he run out screaming like that? This happened months ago and the good news is that I haven't seen him since. But I am definitely uncomfortably aware of just how vulnerable I am at work now. I have had the misfortune of uh, coming across a few scary guys in my life. My friends will say that I'm a weirdo magnet, so I'm pretty wary and clued up now that I'm a bit older. But when I was a teenager, I suppose you could say that I was very naive. Back when I was 20, me and my family, my mum and my little sister, had moved from a small rural village in the Shires to a, a town down south. It was a huge change and as I'd been having a, a difficult time, I, I welcomed the change of scenery. It was a beautiful town in an affluent part of the country, but I struggled to find a job and became very frustrated as my mum needed a bit of help with money. Over the course of about three months, we became fairly friendly with a middle-aged guy who owned a takeaway shop in town. His name was Phil. If he ever saw us doing some shopping, he would come and chat and ask how the family were and he genuinely seemed like a, a decent caring bloke. So when he said that he might have a job for me in his shop with a, a small flat upstairs that I could rent for next to nothing, I, I thought okay, great, maybe things are looking up. Phil got our address and told me and my mum that he'd pop by early evening time when he had finished and take me in the car to go and see the flat. I get myself looking fairly casual but presentable and I'm feeling excited and confident thinking wow a job and a flat I've killed two birds with one stone I just need to show him that I'm sophisticated and would make a great employee. 
Around 8pm, he knocks on the front door and mum answers and he tells her that will probably only be about half an hour and he'll have me back safe and sound in no time. Now, I didn't take my phone with me as I didn't have any credit to call out and didn't think I'd be needing it for a quick trip up the road and back, but in hindsight, it was a pretty stupid thing to do. Maybe if I'd had my phone on me, it would have deterred him from what he was uh, about to do. So, it's already dark out as it's March and I get in his car and we start driving and he's chatting away, asking how I am and telling me how the flat is like, when within a matter of a few minutes I've noticed that we're not taking the conventional route that takes us directly into town. At first, I think that he's just taking me down some sort of shortcut around the town to get to it and just reason with myself that he knows the area well and I don't. 30 seconds after, I... I realize that he's taking me in the completely opposite direction and I can tell that we're driving away from the populated town and into an area where trees swamp both sides of the road. My brain is now working overtime thinking, where the heck is this guy taking me? And I just about managed to keep my composure and I ask him outright, where are we going? Town's back the other way. He says, I just thought I would take you on a little tour. It's beautiful here with many forests and peaceful places and I'd love to show you them. He tells me this in a, a normal cheery tone. I wasn't capable of saying anything at that moment because the logical and reasoning side of my brain were in full-blown war. I'm trying to keep calm thinking, okay, he seems fairly normal. But why wouldn't he want to show me around? It's a stunning area full of natural beauty and he's probably proud to show me where he lives. The logical side however disagreed and just a, a wave of panic comes over me and a little voice enters my head and shouts, What in the dark? Hell no. Are you stupid? So I, I just kind of sit there in silence, taking in the scenery which is becoming just more and more sinister by the second because at that moment in time I, I didn't know what to think. All I know is that every cell in my body is screaming at me to find a way out of this situation. I started looking for signposts, houses, any distinctive landmarks, ditches, huge trees, anything that I'd be able to use to recognize my way back if I had to bolt from this car. Phil can obviously sense that I'm nervous, so he's just talking away at me about what the job's like and how his staff are friendly, and before I know it, he's slowed down to a crawl and has turned down a, a little muddy rut road with a, a dense tree line on one side and pitch black open fields on the other. And it was at this point that my stomach literally drops and my body contemplates power vomiting all over his car because the reality of what is about to potentially happen hits me like a freight train. I'm thinking to myself, if I jump out of here, I have to be able to run over muddy fields into literally nowhere, but my imagination starts rather helpfully flashing by images of him grabbing me before I get a chance to get out of the door, so I just sit there buckled in the passenger seat not saying a word. I'm just thinking to myself that if he attacks me, don't make a sound, don't give him the satisfaction of showing him that I'm scared. To be completely honest, my, my brain was about as useful as a chocolate teapot. And I was starting to get angry with myself for not doing something, but I was just completely terrified. So, we come out of the top of this little dirt road and there's a tiny little car park surrounded by woodland with one car sat in it. It was clear and there were people in there having sex and as he pulls near the car I realize that he's brought me to a local dogging spot. He turns to me and puts his hand on my knee and says we should do what they're doing with a deadly serious expression on his face. I make this bizarre kind of half nervous laugh and half garbled high pitched whine and try to laugh off the suggestion to show that I'm not into it and I'm super uncomfortable right now. The alarmed expression on his face at my gurgled cackle which sounds like I've swallowed a potato whole clearly freaks him out and I'm mentally congratulating myself for my social awkward and grossly unsexy reaction. He persists though and says that it'll be fun, no one will see us. I say, no I don't want to, plus I'm kind of seeing someone right now. I lied. But he sits there, but he just kind of sits there, smiling at me like a Cheshire cat. Like I'm going to miraculously change my mind at the sight of his weird face or something. I tell him after an insanely uncomfortable 30 seconds that mum will be expecting me home now. 
and more of this as I try my damn hardest not to make eye contact. He tells me that I'm sure she won't mind you being a little bit longer with me. You can trust me, you know, with a, a straight face as we just sit next to the sex wagon parked next to us. I sharply pull my leg away from his grip and I tell him again, Mum is waiting for me, she'll start panicking if I'm not home soon or within the next few minutes, take me home. I look him straight in the face and he knows that I'm not messing around. And without another word, he says, okay, that's fine, I'll take you back now, and drives me out of that creepy seedy place and back home. My finger is hovering over the seatbelt button ready to jump out, mind you, and as we pull up outside of our home, I breathe a sigh of relief as I can see my safety literally a few feet away, and before he can stop me, I'm out and I slam the door behind me. As I'm stepping over a tiny little rope fence around our garden, he gets out of his car and my heart instantly sinks. He tells me, I think I'll pop in and see your mum quickly, and... I swear that I could see a smirk on his face, but I know he's only doing this because he's freaking out, knowing damn well that I'm about to tell her. He was trying to delay the inevitable or scare me into keeping my mouth shut or something. Before I can try and talk him out of it, Mum has heard us pull up and open the front door. I barge past her with just one thought on my mind. I head straight into the kitchen and grab a small knife out of the drawer and I fly into my little sister's room like a madwoman. I say to her, don't you dare leave this room no matter what you hear. And seeing the knife that I'm stuffing up my sleeve, she just looks at me with panic in her eyes and whispers, okay. I walk back into the living room and this guy is sitting on one of the sofas, sprawled out, comfortable as anything, like he's at home or something. And at this point, I see red like the Hulk and I'm ready for this guy and I awkwardly perch myself on the arm of the sofa mum is sitting on the absolute furthest part away from him that I can manage and he just sits there making small talk with my mum about how she's finding the area and are the neighbours friendly, all the while keeping his beady little weasel eyes on my every move. He then pats the sofa cushion next to him and says, why don't you come over here and sit next to me? And I tell him, no, I'm alright here thanks, as I'm fidgeting with my sleeve trying to stop the little knife from falling out in front of me. He laughs and pats the seat next to him again and says, Why are you sat over there? Come here. Honestly, I won't bite. I say to him, No, I'm quite comfortable here, thank you very much. This time through gritted teeth. My mum, bless her, is looking at each of us during this back and forth like a tennis match and I can see something is registering in her eyes and she can see my behaviour is just all off. I've got one bum cheek weirdly pitched on the sofa arm, so I'm half stood up, half kind of sat down, and I'm fiddling about with my sleeve. I'm twitchy as hell and staring my mum in the face intensely, mentally trying to speak to her through the power of telepathy alone. I honestly must have looked like just a, a complete nutter. She finally speaks though and says, it's getting late now, so I think you should go. Mum is starting to look anxious now as she had finally twigged that something had happened. Phil gets up and agrees and mumbles something about having to check something at his shop. And when he walks by me and is nearly out of the room, he pauses and turns to me and puts his hand out to shake mine. I'm thinking to myself, what a weird thing this is to do, and I take the opportunity to kindly offer him my hand that had the knife. Taking it with a bit more force than is polite, he soon yanked his grubby mitt out of mine when the tip of the blade had jabbed him. He looked down and saw the blade and then looked at me and I looked at him with just so much disgust. And at this point, Phil just hightailed it out of our home without another word. I told my mum everything and she was honestly fuming. We did discuss going to the police but there wasn't really a crime committed on his part aside from just being a major creep. Sadly, when I mentioned to a couple of girls my age who lived down our street, they just clammed up and shot each other a strange look. I could only guess that he'd probably done this type of thing before. We moved away from the area after that, and to be honest, I'm glad to report that I've never seen his smug face ever again. My family has a small acreage in the Canadian prairies and it's not too far out from the city but far enough that it was very rare to have unexpected visitors. 
At the time, we had some sheep and some chickens, but it wasn't a huge farm by any means. It was just my mum, my dad, my sister and I, and my sister was five years older than me, so I was only about seven at the time. We also had a sweet dog named Maggie. My parents have always said that she was the best farm dog that we ever had. She was some sort of a, a cross with shaggy black hair and was really sweet with the animals and kids. She also never barked or got upset without a, a very good reason, much unlike our last pup who, bless her soul, would bark at the wind. Anyway, my dad was out of town this particular night, probably visiting my grandpa in his town down south. My mum was alone with us little guys and Maggie was sleeping soundly on the porch. Now, my mum woke up in the middle of the night to Maggie growling. My mum's a pretty light sleeper, so it doesn't take much to wake her up, but this was a very unusual behaviour for our pup. My mum thought that it was probably just an animal, so she took a peek outside Sometimes coyotes or large bucks would just upset Maggie, so that was the most likely explanation. However, this wasn't the case that night. Our farm is right adjacent to the highway and there's a long, unlit lane that leads into our yard. It wasn't obvious at first, but my mum saw a dark vehicle slowly creeping down the lane. The car's headlights were shut off and we didn't have a lot of light in the yard, so it was pretty hard to see. But my mum's stomach immediately sunk. Anyone with good intentions wouldn't shut off their headlights like this. She also had two little kids in the house that she had to protect. So she watched them slowly creep into the yard and I don't know how many there were but at least a couple of guys got out of the vehicle and headed towards the shop where my dad keeps his tools. At the time there was a big power panel on that side that controlled all of the electricity to the yard lights in the house too. They opened it up and started to go through it, evidently trying to figure out how to shut off the power, but God knows what their true intentions were, but luckily my family has a hunting rifle and my mum grew up on a farm so she knows her way around a gun. So, rifle in hand, she quietly propped open the door just enough to stick the barrel out. She fired a few warning shots in the guy's direction and they freaked out and hopped back into their vehicle, reversing all the way down the lane so that she couldn't see their license plate. To this day, we obviously have no idea what these guys' plans were, but maybe it was just to rob us, but the idea of people pulling into the yard with no headlights and shutting off the power, it's definitely unsettling and a lot more could have happened, for sure. By the way, I'm extremely grateful for our sweet Maggie and my badass mum for keeping us safe. It's been 21 years since this happened, but I sure hope that we never see those guys again. So first, let me just say that this happened almost 20 years ago now, so I'm a little bit foggy on a few details. So, I was 15 years old and I was really into punk rock. I had a pink mohawk and wore Doc Martin boots and my clothes were adorned with patches with band logos on them. I'm telling you this because my mum always chastised me for looking a bit like a prostitute and honestly, maybe I did. Anyway, I was walking home the city's main street from my boyfriend's house about two miles away from home when a car pulls up beside me and the driver asks me for directions to get to the second street. The numbered streets are way downtown so I figured this bozo was just totally lost. Naive me goes up to the passenger window and I see he has a map out on his lap. This guy honestly looked like every suburban dad that I'd ever seen and there was even a car seat in the back so I figured that he was harmless. I told him something like, oh you must be really lost if you think 2nd street is around here, let me see the map, I'll show you where you need to go. And as soon as I reached in the window, two things happened. The map slides off his lap and I can see that his junk is out, and he grabs me by my arm and tries to pull me in through the window. I was in so much shock that I didn't even think I screamed. I just remember that he was pulling me in by my left arm, so I started punching him in the neck and the chest with my right. He only got me into the car up to my waist before he let go of me and I was able to scramble out of the window. All of this happened so fast that I can't remember if he said anything or if I did or really if anything else happened. After that though, I 
ran as fast as I could away from the car and toward my house, and he actually tried to follow me in the car for a while. I crossed the street where there were some boys riding their bikes on some dirt ramps by the freeway, and I didn't start to cry until I saw them, and I just burst into tears and begged one of them to walk me home so that I wouldn't be alone for this creep to snatch me up again. The kid on the bike was probably the same age as me, but he was my hero as far as I was concerned because he walked me all the way back to my block and the guy in the car eventually gave up. My first day of moving into student halls, I was greeted by a very friendly guy called Dominic. He offered to help me unpack in my room then go for a drink with me. And... Although I thought this was a, a little bit over familiar, I was delighted that I'd made a friend so quickly and accepted his offer. He put a tremendous amount of effort into helping me put everything in the appropriate places in my room. We then went for a drink at the student bar and I made a point to tell him that I was straight, as I suspected that he might have a bit of a crush on me, hence why he was being so nice. However, he didn't show any signs of dismay and continued chatting to me. I liked him a lot too. He was very intelligent and interesting to talk to, and I was really pleased that I had a new friend already. I was worried for quite some time that I'd be lonely in the dorm rooms. He didn't live in the same building as me, mind you. He just lived across the street a bit. I was studying creative writing, and he was studying business, but we started to hang out a lot. Although I liked Dominic, I, I did start to find him a, a little bit overbearing. He would send me texts and message me on Facebook all the time and would get upset if I didn't reply, even if it was only for about five minutes. He would always want to know what I was doing and if I disappeared off of Facebook for a while, he would want to know where I'd been all day. One time I even sent him a text mentioning that I was on a train and he texted back, why are you on a train? Why am I not invited to wherever you're going? I was on my way to my part-time job, mind you. I also made quite a few other friends and he would always show visible signs of displeasure whenever they were around and whenever I talked to him about them he would tell me that he disliked them and that I shouldn't trust them. He was very possessive and I personally can't stand clingy friends so I just tried to distance myself from him for a bit but the more I pulled away the tighter he held. I still hung out with him and still cared about him but I was starting to worry about where this friendship was going. I was pretty sure that this guy had a crush on me and soon my suspicions were confirmed. I met this girl at a party that I went to called Anne and asked her out on a date. She accepted and I was really thrilled and told Dominic about it and the second I told him, his face fell. He asked me, sounding very worried, why are you going on a date with her? I said, well, because I want to. He said, but I'm going to be jealous. Please don't go. It'll hurt me. You wouldn't want to hurt me, right? I'm your best friend. I had never actually told him that he was my best friend before, and I found the way that he was acting now both annoying and a little bit creepy. I said, I'm sorry, but I told you I was straight before Dominic. We can still be friends, but I'm not going to stop dating just for you. He remained sulky and miserable for the rest of the night and I just told myself that he'd have to accept it and get over it soon. But when I was on a date with Anna, I kept getting phone calls from an unknown number. I answered at first, but I couldn't hear anything on the other end. It was just as though someone was listening. I started to ignore the calls, but you would not believe how frequently they were coming in. But they were coming in non-stop and I couldn't even tell the time because they seriously just wouldn't stop. I had to put my phone on airplane mode and after about an hour of my phone in airplane mode I switched airplane mode off but the very second I did, the calls came in again. Although I was unnerved, I enjoyed my date with Anna and we agreed to meet up again. When I got home from the date, Dominic was waiting right outside of my dorm, his phone in hand. He asked, how was your date? Do you like her? Sounding miserable. I told him, yeah, I do. Was that you that kept calling me? He said no, but he was obviously lying, and then said, but anyway, I've been waiting to tell you. I hear Anna's a, a massive hoe. She sleeps around with loads of guys and you should stay away. She'll break your heart. Anna had no mutual connections with Dominic, so 
I asked him how he possibly could know about this. He just told me that he'd done his research and I was angered and told him that it was none of his business and that I'd find out for myself. And at this point, he started crying and saying how he was just worried about me and stormed off. I think that he was hoping that I'd follow him, but I didn't, and I just went to my room, angry that he would try to interfere with my life like this. I've had unrequited crushes on friends before, but if they don't feel the same, I never try to force it, but Dominic only got worse. When I got back to my student room, Dominic had sent me screenshots on Facebook of a, a conversation that he'd allegedly had with Anna. The messages showed her boasting to him about how she was using me and how she was planning to break my heart. Obviously, this didn't ring true at all because, one, how would she even know who Dominic was and why would she message him? And two, why would she tell a friend of mine so openly what her plans for me were when he would obviously show me? I demanded that he show me the conversation from Anna on his computer screen with me there, but he told me that he had deleted the conversations because they were too upsetting for him to read. I knew right there and then that Dominic was deliberately trying to ruin my relationship with Anna through incredibly deceitful and despicable means, and I told him that I wasn't interested in him, that I would never be, and that he better stop right now. He told me that I was being a terrible friend and that all he was doing was trying to look out for me and that he couldn't believe I was believing a stranger over him. I was seriously angry at this point with the way that he was selfishly trying to manipulate me now and blocked him on social media. He started sending me constant texts and calling me non-stop every day, telling me things like he was so depressed over me that he started to take heroin and that he was contemplating killing himself, basically just trying to make me worry. He would also constantly send me texts saying that he knew Anna was cheating on me, that me and her started dating properly at this point, and that I had to come to my senses. He was creeping me out so much that I went to stay with my parents for a bit as I wasn't comfortable living in the same area as him. I had to block his number because the phone calls were so constant as well. People from my uni dorm were actually sending me angry messages as well because Dominic had told them a a really twisted version of what was going on, making them think that Anna was a, a dirty STD-ridden whore who I had betrayed him for. It then turned out that he'd been lying to everyone, telling them that, that me and him were in a, a romantic and sexual relationship and that I had cheated on him with Anna, then left him for her. I furiously set everyone straight, told them that I had never been in a relationship with Dominic and that everything he'd told them about Anna was a complete lie. Most people believed me too, although it took a while to convince everyone that Dominic was the liar. He was really manipulative and although a lot of his lies were just ludicrous, he was very good at making himself sound legit. I decided to go back to my uni dorm after a while as it was inconvenient for me to stay at my parents while at uni, their house was just too far away from it and I arrived back there quite late as I really didn't want to run into Dominic. I was so angry with him and I had a new girlfriend and studies to think about, yet because of his stupid obsession and harassment, he was now all I could think about. In a very twisted way, I think that this was exactly what he wanted too. Positively or negatively, he wanted me thinking about him non-stop. When I got back, I laid down on my bed and I was just thinking about what to do when suddenly there was a huge smash. A brick came flying through my window. I honestly jumped a mile and rolled over to the side of my bed, hiding there for a moment, thinking that it was burglars coming in or something, but nothing more happened. Once I got over the shock, I cautiously stepped over the broken glass and tried to look out the window, and that's when I got a phone call off of a number that I didn't recognize. I answered it, and it was Dominic, and you will not believe what he said. He shouted at me that I just saw Anna throw a brick through my window and run. I told you she was bad news. You should have listened to me. I told you. You would not believe the rage that I felt. I was so angry and I couldn't even speak for a moment. But then, I just exploded. I screamed at him that I knew it was him and I was calling the police right now. He tried to protest but I hung up on him and I immediately called them. 
When they arrived, Dominic was not in his room, but when it was opened, a large stash of illegal drugs was found there, and the manager of my student halls assured me that he'd be getting kicked out for this, and that the police said that they'd be getting in touch with him. And after this, I, I never saw Dominic again. I changed my phone number and never unblocked him on social media. A couple of times, I have to admit I was tempted to out of just sheer curiosity, but decided that it just wasn't worth it. I think he dropped out of uni, but I don't know exactly what happened to him. My relationship with Anna didn't last as well. She was never quite clear on why she ended it, but I actually suspect that Dominic's freakish behavior may have actually scared her off, even though it wasn't my fault. But, ah well, life goes on, right? This particular event happened to me when I was around 10 or 11 years old, but I've been visiting my grandma's cabin in Big Bear Lake several times a year ever since I was a child. This isn't the first paranormal event that I've experienced there, but it's definitely the most memorable. So, a little backstory first. My grandma's cabin sits at the end of a, a cul-de-sac right at the edge of a, a vast and mostly unpopulated, aside from a, a few other cabins, stretch of forest. And no matter what I do or how I'm feeling, I always have a really strong sensation that um, I'm just being watched when I'm in many of the rooms of the cabin alone, day or night. I've seen shadow creatures many times in this cabin, have heard strange knocking and whispers, and just generally feel like there's something else living with us there. My grandma has told me of similar experiences and has warned me before that if I ever get a strange feeling when I'm walking in the forest, to just go home immediately, but she never really elaborated on that. Anyways, so me and my dad and my uncle were walking on a trail that we've been on hundreds of times before. When we reached the first peak of the hill that we usually like to stop and look out of the view from, my dad and uncle wanted to keep hiking for a bit, but... I decided to go back to the cabin on my own as it was only a 5 or 10 minute walk away. I head down the usual path that I go on, not thinking too much about it, when I realize that I have no idea where I am. What I mean by this too is that everything looked the same as usual, but something was just wrong. The normal path was different in a way that I just can't really explain. It seemed to be just 10 times as long as usual, and... Everything was just dead silent. There was absolutely no wildlife around me and, I mean, not even a squirrel sound. I kept having all of these really morbid thoughts coming into my head as well about how I was lost forever or how some sort of creature was going to swoop me up. Every 10 minutes or so, I would end up at a part of the trail that I definitely recognized, but only to be in a, a completely alien area moments later. The path kept winding and winding downhill and the sun was setting rapidly as well. I had to have been walking in the direction of the cabin for at least more than an hour because I remember I kept checking my watch and panicking. At this point, I, I just accepted that I was lost. But I finally made it down to the street and was relieved to be able to orient myself, but it was only one street away from the cabin, although I, I should have been way further away. I was expecting my father and uncle to be home by now and for my parents to be worried sick about me being gone so long, but instead my, my mum asked me why I came back so soon. I asked my dad how long they were out as well and they said that they'd only walked maybe 15 minutes longer from when I left them, which was completely impossible. I don't know if I'm just reading too much into this and if I was just a, a kid with different perceptions, but... Something just definitely felt very off about the whole ordeal. This happened several years ago, I think, and I must have been around 15 at the time. So, it's a long drive to our holiday home. Usually, the ride takes about uh, two and a half hours. On this particular Friday, the major motorway nearby had been closed off. And this meant that all of that traffic was now crammed onto the back roads that we take to get to where we were going. It's also the middle of summer, so our windows are down and everyone is aggravated. We get to this long stretch of road and it's very slow moving. Despite looking ahead and seeing an open road with 
this odd car from the front heading away from our direction. This is also in the middle of nowhere and is just a road everyone is using to try and beat the traffic. There are heavy trees down both sides and about 25 meters away from the road and there are several bushes along the grass between the road and the tree line. We get to the front of this queue and there's a man standing in the middle of the road blocking our path, arms spread wide. He walks over to my dad who is driving and asks him to get out of the car and help him move his car which has rolled into a ditch. He also looks at me and my sister in the back of the car and says that he has three children in the back of his car all crying their eyes out. And those were exactly the words he used. Now this is really odd because the car doesn't look to be stuck just parked close to the bushes on a downward slope. It was getting late, but it was still relatively light, and there was visibly nobody in the car. And the windows on his car, they were down as well. And if there were kids crying, we definitely would have heard them. My dad picks up on this and apologizes and tells the man no, as he has kids of his own to look after. The guy insists and says that his wife is getting wound up with the heat as well. He asks again for my dad to get out of the car and help him push. Again, my dad tells him no, to which the guy responds, Okay, but I'm not letting anyone else pass me until they help. My dad then speeds off relatively quickly and I turned around to see the guy, just standing arms wide, blocking the cars behind us. I remember asking my dad why he didn't stop and help and he told me that he just got a bad vibe from the guy. I asked him about the crying kids and my mother said that she couldn't hear anything either. None of us did. It's possible that this guy was just genuinely in trouble, but the whole situation, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And it creeped me out for a while after it too. I mean, if he did have a wife and kids with him, where were they? And if his children were crying their eyes out, why couldn't we hear them? In my mind, I think the whole thing was just a setup for a carjacking. So let me start with uh, some background information first. So my mum and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all the years as missionaries, I haven't really encountered many paranormal experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked out my dad. This story began around the time my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mum wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. This woman was selling homemade household items such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, all that sort of stuff. My mum spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador, and she bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he saw it. He just got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. Anyway, a few days later, my mum hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut too, but he just continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was 1am and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water as he was thirsty. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and just stared at the doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung there and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge to get the jug of water out. As he was getting his glass of water and putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and... His heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth, all by itself. Now, there were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do, and we had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans, so there was no way that air was making the doll swing back and forth like this. My dad was stock still as he stared at the doll. The doll swinging started to pick up its pace, and then just started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought that it was actually going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. 
As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things, and he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll, and as he walked back to the bedroom where my mum was, he prayed and asked God for protection, and he also checked on me and my brother before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mum what he experienced and my mum was honestly horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over or against any evil that was within the doll and wrapped it up in several plastic bags just before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. But since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home and if they do buy a decoration off the street or something, they always pray over it to cast out any evil spirits that might be lurking inside. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.